Okay, good morning, everyone. We're just a, a few minutes uh, running over time. Um, my name is Alexandra Wild. I'm with UNDP's Global Policy Center for Governance. Um, I'm not Arvind Gadgil, who is our director. Um, I'm uh, stepping in for him until he 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 gets here. So sending sending his apologies. Um, but welcome to this special side event on a very very important topic a dialogue on building trust in statistics to counter disinformation in an information overloaded world. So we're going to hear from um, some of our distinguished panelists on um, aspects of this uh, issue. Um, but before then, I want to uh, acknowledge the co-hosts for this special side event, Statistics Norway, uh, the UN Statistics Division and uh, NORAD. Um, so this morning we are discussing a subject that is vital to the progress of our societies and the global community as a whole, trust in statistics. So in a world where data drives almost as every aspect of our lives, from the decisions made by governments to the actions taken by businesses, the importance of trusting the statistics we rely on cannot be overstated. But trust is not automatic and needs to be earned. So we're going to be looking at some of that. We will hear in the session some important perspectives and insights. Um, but first, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, uh, this dialogue session will finish at 9.30 and then we will segue into the, the official opening of the, of the meeting of the IAEG. Um, and then after the session, after that, after the formal opening at 10 a.m., the closed meeting of the IAG will start. So that will happen at uh, 10 a.m. Um, and this event and the opening that will follow straight after is being recorded um, and it will be uploaded to uh, UNDP's Global Policy Centre for Governance website and also the website of the UN Statistics uh, Division. So um, just to do a little bit of framing uh, for the session, just a couple of a couple of minutes, um, I want to stress two points. Uh, the first is really um, to, to look at this um, problem of disinformation and then also to, to, to touch on some of the responses to it and why UNDP is uh, uh, particularly concerned about uh, uh, having this conversation that we're having today. So. Um, the problem of disinformation and misinformation, it's spreading at an alarming rate, as we're all aware. It's being fueled by social media and the ease with which information can be manipulated. Um, it's driven by algorithms, influences, bots, artificial intelligence, and now generative AI. Disinformation is spreading faster and further than ever before. Uh, these technologies, as we know, they're amplifying the reach of disinformation and they're further complicating the fight against it. Um, I think the Secretary General called this an infodemic, the UN Secretary General, and it's created environments where facts are contested and misinformation can ever overshadow truth. Um, uh, it's not only an inf infodemic, but the Secretary General more recently has called the threat of disinformation or the lack of information integrity as an existential threat to humanity. Um, so uh, for UNDP, for our part, um, we are helping countries to develop and strengthen their own national statistical systems. We are helping countries build their capacity to produce, analyze, and use reliable, high-quality data for decision making. Um, and we've been, you know, working in more than a, 120 countries. Um, for the for the center, we're especially uh, interested in advancing governance statistics, and they're especially important to this topic today. Uh, one of the major casualties of disinformation is public trust in institutions. Government statistics help restore this trust by offering transparency and accountability. And when governance data 
particularly is collected and disseminated openly. It allows citizens to see how their government is performing in key areas such as public service delivery, judicial integrity, law enforcement and policy. Uh, we're all aware that this is a big elections year. 2024 is the mega, mega elections year. And a, an important part of what UNDP does and through the centre is to strengthen electoral integrity. So we're providing assistance to as many as 35 elections a year. And um, this space, the electoral space, is often challenged with disinformation. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, another really uh, significant example, this is where it's so fundamental that um, uh, that there are accurate and transparent statistics around uh, democratic processes. So now, uh, without uh, further ado, we're going to start a bit of a, a panel discussion. Um, and I would like to begin uh, with a question first for Denise uh, Cronenberger, who is the co-chair of the Interagency and Expert Group on Sustainable Development Goals Indicators. Um, Denise, what are the factors that build trust and confidence in statistics and contribute to their legitimacy? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your inviting me to take part in this important side event. Uh, I have selected some factors that I believe uh, contribute to construct trust and confidence to official statistics. In a world with more and more information from uh, from other sources, non-official in general, uh, NSOs must work together with other sectors such as civil society, academia, private sector, to produce more data and fill the current gaps. Partnership and cooperation across the national statistical system are fundamental for data sharing, such as administrative data or work with non-traditional data. Therefore, the availability and timeliness of time series data, statistics and indicators are very important, in addition to, of course, quality assurance. Produce statistics to meet the demands of the society, uh, like data-driven and the statistics-driven policy making. Openness, accessibility and effective use of statistics accountability and the transparency. All these factors that I mentioned here uh, in the funda fundamental principles of official statistics, which are the differential from non-official non sources. This is our advantage. Uh, so what do you need to improve to raise people's awareness? Uh, the fourth uh, fundamental principle of the official statistics is the prevention of misuse of statistics. To a certain extent, the NSO can do some auditing and the control of this disinformation. Uh, however, considering the massive amount of information uh, of that kind, the best way to grant principle for is to ensure that the citizens themselves are able to criticize the statistics they find daily in media. To enable and calibrate this critical eye, investing in statistical literacy is key. In IBGE, for example, the Brazilian NSO we value initiatives that help develop this capacity uh, with several publics. With the school public, we have extension projects conducted by the IBGE National School of Statistics that work on the survey investigate cycle and that develop capacities to identify misuse of statistics in news. We have an educational portal, IBGE Educa, dedicated to facilitate the access of the geographical and the statistical information we produce. And in this year, 
we are promoting the international statistical poster competition of the international statistical literacy project. Uh, and with the media professionals, uh, we have uh, news agents that soften journalists' contacts with hard technical data, digesting this contact content uh, into a journalistic language and often explain concepts of difficult apprehension. With librarians, we have a project to teach them how to access our information and how to multiply this knowledge in their local public services. Uh, and it, it's most important thing is to promote external dissemination of any SEO's production in different ways of communication and society, reaching informants, users and the society as a whole, seeking to increase awareness about the production of the NSEO and their importance. This can be done through advertising campaigns or uh, maybe in other examples that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, and it returns to, to the, the benefits to the society, also improving and expanding the dissemination of research results. But the statistical literacy for us is the, the key, key word. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, lots of really valuable insights there and, uh, from the overarching principles around um, openness and accessibility and beginning also with the importance of NSOs working with other sectors. Some great examples around uh, statistical literacy and the excellent initiatives you're taking forward in, in Brazil and how important dissemination is. Um, uh, of 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 the of the statistics, I'm going to ask um, uh, Yong Yi Min, the Chief Sustainable Development Goals Monitoring uh, uh, Section uh, of the Statistics Division of UNDESA, uh, the same question, uh, so that we can uh, see what kind of um, what kind of complementary insights you bring um, to the this, uh, uh, the excellent response from uh, from Denise? So, what are the factors, or additional factors, or reinforcing factors that build trust and confidence in statistics, and again contribute to their legitimacy? Uh, over to you, Yong Yu. Thank you. Thank you very much Alex, for this uh, very important question on how to build trust uh, in official statistics. Let me uh, to uh, emphasize from international uh, organization po point of view, in particular from UN Statistical Division and uh, use the example of the SDG indicator monitoring process and the work from the, the uh, interagency and the expert group on uh, SDG indicator. So I would like to maybe just um, focus on like uh, three factors. Uh, the first uh, factor I would like to emphasize uh, is um, uh, methodological uh, standards. Uh, so it's very important uh, that we have uh, uh, like international methodology standard uh, to uh, talk about the indicators. It's like the university language uh, for data, um, similar to we have uh, the need the same language to communicate across border. So when we talk about the poverty rates uh, and hunger rate, uh, when we talk, uh, we can we know they're talking about the same thing. So when we compare the the child mortality rate from Kenya, uh, from uh, uh, like a Korea, for example, so, and they use the same methodology. So the mes international methodology standard ensure the comparability across the country. Uh, this is a super in important uh, through the IEG process. Uh, I, I, uh, the um, uh, IG and the international agency working together with the country to ex establish this international standards. We know at the very beginnings at the uh, one third of the SD indicator, what tier three basically, there's no international standards over the years, like in in the past eight nine years, and the, the 
global statistical community work very hard uh, together to establish this international standard. Through this work, many of the, the um, like a difficult to monitor process, uh, we now we know how to monitor. And, and so we, now we just have to build the capacity in country to, to do this work. Um, the second point I would like to emphasize, also the lesson learned from this uh, SDG process uh, is open and transparency. And openness and transparency is super important. And, and because the, the indicator process is actually not only a technical process, it's also a political process. And so through our the IG meetings and the, the group has been a very open and transparent about each step. Use this year's example in the 2020 conference review. So we carry out, the IG group carry out the each step in an open transparent way. So we have the, the um, call for like a proposal for the 2025 review. Then we have the open the global open consultation on the proposals. And then we the IEC shared all the information online. And the process is also inclusive. We don't this, uh, differentiate who can contribute. That any, anyone, they, if they have a, a solid proposal, they can send this uh, to the process. Uh, maybe the last uh, point I just want to like reinforce um, is the communication. Mm -hmm. I, I think the statistic is very, uh, Sometimes it's very challenging to understand how to communicate. For example, we have 231 indicators in the SDGs framework, and, and the, for the general public, how how we can let the general public understand this complex global indi indicator framework. I know at the country level, many country and um, use the SDG dashboard, um, the open platform, and try to use this information educate uh, the the general public and as a global level, we also publish this uh, um, uh, SDG report uh, every year. So we use uh, like an infographic and uh, storytelling uh, styles to try to um, make uh, each like a uh, complex indicators to, to make a story and to talk about the global progress towards the SDGs. So maybe I will just finish uh, here, just emphasize these three uh, important factors. Thank you. That's, uh, that's really great, Yongi, also to to anchor that question within the context of the work of the IEGs and really uh, unpacking what trust and legitimacy, legitimacy, what the drivers are for that within this particular process that we're in now, um, looking at methodological standards and um, uh, particularly also for international comparison, openness and transparency and uh, communications. So if other colleagues also on the on the panel want to pick up on some of these issues related to legitimacy, please do. And we can also discuss this further when we come to Q&A in a little while. I'm just going to turn now to Ger Axelsen, who's the Director General of Statistics Norway. And I'd like to ask you, Ger, um, how can the production and dissemination of reliable statistics be protected and promoted in different country contexts? Um, and context matters, right? And there's a diversity of uh, country context that we're we're talking about. Over to you, Gare. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there are several answers, but the most important one I will show you here it's the Statistical Act. It really helps if you want to protect official statistics to have a legal mandate that uh, states the, the purpose, which is to support democracy more or less, that gives a clear mandate to get information from private and public uh, data owners that uh, describes the role of a statistical agency about, uh, it's about quality, about coordination, about cooperation with the other producers of official statistics. And of course, uh, in an act like ours, in the Norwegian Statistical Act, the professional independency is written a lot of, I, mean, I took a word count for the whole document when it was sent to the parliament. I think it was 200 times or something that the name, that the words professional independence was mentioned. So, of course, that is uh, that is crucial if you want to, uh, to have a trust in official statistics. Second, I think international quality requirements is uh, also very important. The Statistical Act need to build on what is uh, the international 
quality requirements. So, for example, the Norwegian Statistical Act in very, it builds on the fundamental principles from the United Nations and and the code of practice from uh, European Union and and also the OECD good statistical practices. These quality requirements are very important, both for the acts in the different countries, but as quality requirements that supports and helps and protects um, official statistics by their own. So, uh, uh, so that's the the second uh, uh, crucial uh, point I would make, and the third is that international statistical cooperation uh, between colleagues, uh, between offices uh, that works with official statistics is very helpful because, uh, as I think Denise mentioned, uh, we are in the same business, even if you work in Brazil or in Jordan or in in Norway, uh, the methodology is more or less the same. Uh, And of course, the context differs a lot, but it's a global language. And of course, we need the same standards. So to learn from each other, uh, learn from each other's mistakes and successes is uh, actually also helpful to promote and develop and improve um, uh, within official statistics. So at least those three uh, first answers from me. That's excellent. And the fundamental importance of strong legislation um, being really key key for, for protecting uh, official statistics. And maybe we'll hear during the discussion some examples, uh, some examples of that where uh, legislation can, um, can be strengthened uh, also to protect professional independence. But this point you make too, Gare, about um, uh, the sort of global space and the opportunities to exchange and to um, on sort of lessons and, and mistakes also being really crucial. Um, I just want to turn now to Toro, Toro Pedersen, who's the head of governance for Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, really important partner here. Um, can I ask you, Toro, are development actors supporting statistics and national statistical systems in ways that are strengthening or undermining the data sovereignty of countries? Um, Thank you for the question. I think the short answer is both. Um, and um, um, But I will try to give a little bit more than a one-word answer <laughs> to that uh, question because it is a really important one. So in, in Norad, of course, we're primarily concerned with the uh, uh, lower income uh, countries and lower capacity countries and and uh, to see how we can support um, support investments uh, in this sector using development um, aid and making sure that what we support um, reflects the needs and, and the capacities of lower income and lower capacity countries so that there's a more e- even playing field. But um, I think what we uh, what we're seeing is that um, globally we're seeing a reversal of a lot of the aid effectiveness principles um, that was agreed um, um, in in Paris uh, some some now some decades ago, um, where we, where we're talking about you know how to reduce fragmentation. Um, how to reduce recipient burden of development aid and, you know, how to increase the leadership from countries. And and we're also seeing this uh, within the um, field of statistics and data. Um, and I think particularly for anything that is related to kind of core government functions, such as statistics, uh, we need a broader uh, approach. We need to make sure that we're seeing this as an integral approach rather than uh, what we're seeing now and increased the investments in sector by sector. Um, and uh, so development corporations is sometimes uh, uh, kind of undermining that that the independent role, the independent role and the holistic role um, of national statistical offices. It's not a discussion that we're having uh, to the extent that we need to have because also we're lacking some of these spaces to have these discussions. Uh, so, so that's why I also really welcome this discussion and we're also trying to see how we can use, uh, increasingly use some of the other processes of the 
um, of the UN uh, this year and, and, and next. Financing for development is an important process where we can see you know, how, how development cooperation can be better at uh, support strengthening uh, the national statistical systems and offices. Um, but with the shrinking aid generally, um, we've also seen a, a reduction of aid going to national statistics uh, uh, offices and national statistics systems in general. There's a competition uh, sometimes between uh, investing in national systems and then the needs for uh, monitoring globally and also monitoring results from, from investment, from aid in general, all sectors. Um, and this is a potential tension that I think is important that we're uh, that we have a discussion around. And I think this entry point through the trust angle and the and the governance angle is the right way of having it because it's building the foundation. So I'm interested also to hear from you know from this room, uh, you know where are the where are the places where we need to be having these uh, uh, where we need to be having these conversations. Um, before, yeah, so uh, I think a lot of good points have been made here. You know, this interaction between between uh, citizens' uh, data and the dialogue with the population and the and the education, and uh, this is something I think we need we need more investments um, in. But we also need to make sure that we're having it uh, systematically. Um, I, maybe I won't say so much more on um, uh, on this. Point, uh, but just recognizing that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, unanswered questions when it comes to uh, when it comes to development cooperation in this uh, field, uh, and just to make a little bit of a sim uh, of a comparison with another area where we're seeing the sim same trend, which is uh, uh, supreme audit institutions. You know, institutions that are core government functions, but with an independence. Uh, sometimes fall out of the conversations because they don't have the the they don't have the voice that some of the other uh, government partners have. Uh, so how to to uh, to shrink that space? Um, I think it's going to is important for us as um, as development actors to take seriously. Mm. Great, thank you, Tara. Lots of really excellent points, and I hope we can come back to several of those during the discussion, um, including also how we can find, you know, global and other spaces to to have this conversation and and to really highlight highlight um, highlight this issue. Um, I'm going to turn now to Cara to my left. Cara Williams is the co-chair of the interagency and expert group on on. SDG indicators together with uh, Denise, two co-chairs. Um, so Cara, I want to ask you your view on how official statistics can be leveraged uh, to fact check and debunk false claims circulating in the media and in social networks and often, you know, in real time. Is there a role for official statistics in that, in that regard? Uh, over to you, Cara. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so first let me say um, the real-time component of that question, I don't think it's possible to address um, misinformation or disinformation in real time. But how can um, official statistics um, be leveraged to fact check, check and debunk claims? It's, this is a really complex uh, question. Um, and if an NSO spends a lot of time doing this, you will be questioned about your priorities. You're funded by the government, so they will see it as government oversight. So you have to be careful. Um, I would say specifically about debunking things on social media, that's just not where um, an organization like Statistics Canada uh, would likely go. I also wanna clarify that um, it is impossible to uh, debunk all claims that may not be true. Um, and may not be true as the NSO would see it. Um, so I'll clarify here. Um, we've had very high inflation rates over the last few years in Canada. Um, and so there was a lot of people calling into question the official inflation rate because that wasn't what people were experiencing when they were going to the shops. Um, so 
their experience of what inflation was and what the official uh, inflation rate was, was completely different. So what can you do? Well, at StatCan, we published the official uh, uh, inflation rate, and then we created an app. What's my inflation rate? So you could go in and you create your own basket of goods, and then you'd find out what your inflation was. And so your inflation rate was, so it resonated with the population. Okay, now we understand that this official inflation rate looks at a set basket that is set at a, a certain time period, um, but it may not be what your basket is. So your experience may be, may be very different. So that's a valid, you know, it's a valid thing that people say the inflation rate is not right. It is right for that basket. Um, so, you know, you need to be um, careful when you want to debunk things um, and how you go about it is also important. You also need to look at the materiality of the claim. So is it worth debunking something that has no materiality? So they got it wrong in the news, but it doesn't have an economic impact. It's not going to move the markets. Is it worth the time and effort to um, debunk it if they got it partially wrong? Um, is uh, would the air lead to um, policy that would be not effective for the country or lead to the spending of public funds that um, would not be uh, in the public's best interest? And who is making that claim? Is it policymakers? Is it the media, et cetera? So I think you need to you need to ask yourself, certainly our organization is never going to fact check a Canadian that you know says something in an op-ed or 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 something like that. Um, uh, you need to understand what is considered a false claim. So right now, here's another example, much along the lines of the uh, inflation rate. Um, GDP per capita in Canada is going down a bit, and StatCan publishes that. But there are others who publish figures that show it is going down by a lot. Is this an error, and should it be corrected? There are those who would say it should be corrected. But in fact, what is being reported is not incorrect. Rather, they're using a different denominator. When we do GDP per capita, we don't look at temporary residents. What was being reported in the media does look at te temporary residents. So it's not wrong, it's just different. And you can explain that it's different, but it's not wrong. And there are actually valid reasons right now why you would include tempor temporary residents. So be very careful when you're thinking about uh, misinformation and disinformation. It may not be wrong, it may just be different. So um, I would say, I would argue that um, NSO should be careful, respond only when it's material, and only when there is a clear indication of harm. Concretely, how can you address misinformation or disinformation? I would suggest a three-pronged approach. I would recommend that the NSO do more in the sphere of data steward for the country as it relates to better advocacy and data literacy training. Denise noted this. Um, so get out there, inform policymakers on how to look at data, how to analyze data, how to be curious um, and critical of what they're looking at. Is it, is it good data? How do you tell? Well, can you find the provenance of it? Is methodology um, uh, available? Who was the one who, who produced it? Um, I'd also note that, um, as Gear noted, um, professional independence doesn't mean isolation, right? So um, get at the policy tables. Um, that doesn't mean you're, impact, you're impacting policy. What it means is you're hearing what the issues are and what they want to have measured. It also will help policy uh, analysts understand um, how to analyze data appropriately, how to access data, um, access and assess data sources, um, and how to uh, use a critical eye when they don't know so that they would have comfort reaching out to the NSO. So that advocacy, you're you're reinforcing your role in in your data system. Um, I would also recommend some easy to use areas on um, NSO's websites. Um, so I mentioned that what's my what's my inflation rate? Um, have those kind of things where you can fact check and explain what are the differences, right? This is why. The official number is this, and this is why your number is, is something else. And then correct when it's material and clearly wrong. I'd also note that you, it's never possible to correct all errors. I wouldn't even try. And I'd also be cautious and curious. Sometimes what might be reported may be different. 
um, and but it may it may not be wrong. So be very careful. Just because something's different doesn't immediately mean it's incorrect. Um, finally, in combating misinformation, don't become the story itself. Don't be the political fodder fodder of this. This is key. Um, be judi judicious in um, combating misinformation, um, and when you do it, make sure you know stand strong um, and note who you are. Uh, very practical, Cara. Lots of um, important do's and don'ts and criteria and, um, you know, really being careful about this notion of debunking and being very careful about the role of the NSO and the response to that. Gare, I've been hearing Gare uh, in agreement with you. Gare, do you want to come in and just say a couple of words about that? Absolutely. And others on the panel too before I was we move inspired to by Gare's uh, very strong and good uh, <laughs> points uh, because if you look at the NSO's role uh, in the fight against uh, disinformation, uh, our asset is trust, that we deliver trusted numbers and insights. And it takes time to build trust. Uh, you, and it's, you can tear it down quite quickly. So uh, if you uh, move into uh, the kind of a political arena, or at least are seen as a political actor, then you risk to damage the trust. That was the asset uh, in, to start with. So uh, our most important role here is not to, not to actively go out there and debate other numbers, but of course, if our own numbers are misused, we can always go out there and explain and correct. But uh, if we are seen as a political actor, then we tear down the trust. So therefore, we should be a bit conservative, to be honest. Um, anyone else feel burning to come in on that? Otherwise, we'll stay with Gare and ask you another question, if that's okay. And it's kind of related. Um, so if you could just share, you know, what you see as... Um, no, actually... Toral, I'm going to jump to you. Is that okay with you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I've got a sequencing here that I'd like, you know, this is okay. Um, can you can you just share with us, uh, Toral, um, how the production of no, that's that's not right either. Sorry. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I really want to hear from you. How do you see that the production and dissemination of reliable statistics can be protected and promoted in uh, in different contexts? Over to you, Toro. Yes. It's a very big question, so it I won't be able to it is. <laughs> answer we them all. Uh, but give some per, um, perspectives um, on this. And I... And, uh, it builds a bit on what um, Carol was also um, saying, and in um, I think a bit of the narrative, you know, about um, about uh, reaching out to um, to the pop general population about the role, uh, I think is very uh, I think is very imp important, and from a governance perspective in the development context, it's. It's we've been focusing a lot on, uh, you know, how can we support strengthening a social contract when we're being focused on we we'll focus on, you know, revenues on one side and then expenditures on the other side, um, not really recognizing that the data and statistics uh, is this element that kind of links these two, and uh, uh, we, because if we if if the general population don't have statistics or data uh, to engage with the, this, then a lot of that um, uh, information that is gets out there, it it might be controlled by uh, one uh, one political side or another political side, and in and in developing countries, we've also seen that there's com there's a competition with international actors, right? So that we see ministries uh, um, ministries of finance using primarily. Uh, data from the World Bank and rather than from uh, economic statistics from from the N NSOs, and this creates a little bit of a uh, well, also contributes maybe to under undermine that uh, element of trust in the in the National Statistical Office. And like Kara said, it's not that the one is right and the other one is wrong. 
Um, but as you're leaning uh, towards an international uh, source and not uh, and not using the national um, uh, produced uh, statistics, that's uh, that's a challenge. Um, so I would like us also to just highlight when there isn't. Uh, when the, when that uh, st statistics hasn't been produced uh, or it's not available, and highlighting that is also a good service uh, to the to the the general population. And this is why maybe we're using it and an, an alternative source. But sometimes it's there, mm -hmm. but we still uh, uh, we still find it more credible to use World Bank or IMF uh, data mm -hmm. rather than uh, nationally. So. So um, yeah, so uh, looking at you know the whole um, ecosystem, being honest about you know where there are gaps, where we don't have uh, where we don't have good statistics and data, and also being very open when we're use when we're using um, either uh, surveys or proxies uh, uh, that uh, yeah. So it comes back to a lot of the. Uh, explaining uh, the differences in the different data sets, but also for people to have mm, enough um, basic understanding of the role of, of the statistics. So, mm. um, some of those. Mm. That's uh, incredibly helpful to get a user perspective and to understand that navigation of the the data uh, ecosystem and to be critical about why some sources of data are used and not others. And we've got other data users in, in the room. So it'd be great to sort of um, uh, explore that a little bit when we come to the q and in, uh, in a very short moment. But final, final question for, for, for Gare, um, because this issue of statistical literacy has come up a lot on the, on the, in the panel and in this discussion. So I just want to ask you, Gare, um, what do you see as the challenges and, and, you know, maybe some solutions for uh, strengthening the use of statistics where they are really difficult to understand and and are you know being misused. So um, over to you, Gear. Just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, as described by several, the, the challenges are of course that it is uh, information is more available than ever. That uh, it's hard for uh, the the broad public to separate. Uh, you know what can be trusted and and what is uh, kind of uh, uh, driven by some kind of agenda uh, uh, or even conspiracy driven uh, so uh, and in that environment of course our role as statistical offices is to make sure that we have a relevant uh, uh, timely uh, uh, numbers that uh, the, the broad public can uh, understand uh, uh, the methods behind them uh, and what do they tell. So st to, to promote statistical literacy is, of course, a core answer. So to build partnership with the school sector, for example, to have web pages that are available for teachers in their uh, classes with their students. Uh, that is an investment in building understanding. Uh, so, so I think that is a very important example. And as, as Kara mentioned earlier, uh, professional independence doesn't mean that you are isolated from users. On the contrary, you have to be in contact with users every day. Uh, because as statisticians, we want to mirror the society, we want to describe different phenomena in the society and then you have to you know sometimes uh, the map doesn't uh, you know fit exactly to the terrain and then you have to adjust or at least discuss with the users uh, so uh, that's that's part of uh, of also this uh, being relevant that you have to to also be what should I say customer uh, oriented and if you think of the statistical organizations, they, they are not mono, monopolists. Probably we have never been monopolists, but I think in, you know, 100 years ago, it was fewer actors out there. Uh, so uh, to think uh, that we are in a competition and we compete every day and we have to be agile, we have to be turnaround when uh, new user needs uh, come up be able to handle changes in the data environment uh, because that's crucial to get actually new data that can be you know uh, used to produce new insights 
that's part of the the kind of mindset that we need to to bring with us. Uh, excellent. Okay, um, we're going to have a bit of a uh, a break from the from the panelists and hopefully hear hear from from you all in in the room. There've been lots of excellent uh, points. Um, we've got about ten minutes, I think, just to hear how some of these issues that have been raised are resonating uh, in the room. I think it's really interesting what both. Um, Gare and Cara saying about professional independence not meaning isolation and the sort of you know to be active in the in the community. So uh, please say your name also before uh, in your institution when, and stand up. That would, would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. My name is Ruth Coppens uh, and I work in UNEP uh, in the SDG and Environment Statistics Unit. Um, I think it's uh, a very uh, important point uh, to discuss uh, how to build trust in statistics. Uh, and I think there are two partners. Uh, basically, you have the statistical community who is responsible for the statistics and how they are produced but unfortunately doesn't have that much control over how these statistics are presented because there are different ways in uh, using statistics. You can choose which statistics will you present and you can choose not to present certain statistics. Um, so the way that statistics are explained uh, can be very misleading. And so a large part of building that trust is not in the hands of the statisticians who produce them. So do you think for a national statistical office there would be a role in calling out when you see that the statistics that are produced by the statistical office are not used or represented the way in a way that is correct. Um, I know that many see statistics or the National Statistical Office as if you want a service provider, but would you agree that maybe uh, there is also a role for the National Statistical Office to guard the way the statistics are used? Great. Thank you. We'll take uh, one or two more uh, interventions or questions. I think down here in the front, I saw first... Uh, down here, the two down here, and then up the back over there, over to uh, yeah. Nicola. And then, yeah, I'll stand. Okay. Good, thanks. So, um, my name is Ego Holland, and I'm from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation, and also thank you uh, to, to the panel. Uh, it's a very important uh, topic, and um, I'm just also just to state the obvious, I, mean, I would like to express no ways, um, of course, for political and moral support uh, to the meeting you're having today, and also um, saying that the job you're doing uh, is impressive. And I understand also that the main topic of your meeting is uh, um, is addressing uh, inequality, um, which is a priority for 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 Norway. Um, and also looking very much forward to hear the outcomes of your of your meeting. So um, I um, just to state the obvious that of course uh, building and sustaining strong na uh, national statistical systems is vital, and, and Norway through NORAD and also in cooperation with Statistics Norway, um, we support uh, capacity development within statistics um, through the knowledge program statistics. Uh, um, and register collaboration, and also in addition, professional collaboration on statistics, and in including 
um, is included in other uh, knowledge uh, programs. So it's a very, it's an important part of our uh, development uh, program. Uh, and I think it's it's increased a bit uh, through the last years, which is uh, which is good. Uh, but it's also key in reaching our goals when it comes to uh, inequality that I mentioned. That is also very much linked to uh, not only goal 10, but also 16 and uh, 17. Mm. Um, that has to do with good, good governance, uh, reducing illicit financial flows and corruption, and increasing uh, domestic resource mobilization. Uh, that we put a lot of effort into uh, when it comes to tax. Uh, you mentioned Toriel, uh, the, the financing for development uh, conference that's coming up, but also, of course, the negotiations on the international tax convention that is right. important. And statistics mm -hmm. is it, it, it's uh, it's fundamental in in these uh, processes right because um access to quality assured information um in uh in the form of official statistics is key also uh that uh that um uh, that we can see as taxpayers what our uh, tax money is, is spent on and which results uh we get from them right so mm -hmm. uh, but i have a, i have a question for the for the panel, uh, like I said, uh, statistics uh, are also crucial for managing national and international development initiatives, um, and um, um, and I think the discussion underlines that the importance um, the importance also of building national capacities uh, through our development cooperation as well. So, if you could uh, maybe uh, elaborate a bit more, what you think. Um, the most important unaddressed needs are that we as donors should be aware of in programming for supporting national capacities and maybe especially within this field of, of um, you know, um, mis misinformation and um, I'd love to hear your response. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you, Hega. We'll take one more question. Please be brief because we are running out of time and Yongyi will, will <laughs> get cross with me. So. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, uh, it's a very interesting discussion. I'm uh, Catherine Sun Hendrickson from Norwegian Forum for Development and Environment, and I'd just like to make a comment from a civil society perspective. Uh, civil society plays a crucial role in assuring that the voices of marginalized communities are heard and that data accurately reflects their re realities. To foster trust, we must prioritize transparency and inclusivity in the production and dissemination of statistics. Um, this means ensuring that methods, sources and data are accessible to all and can be scrutinized. It also involves investing in national statistical systems, as already has been mentioned. Uh, the misuse of statistics can harm civil society in several ways, undermining both its credibility and its capacity to advocate for meaningful change. Uh, for instance, uh, through the erosion of public trust, if CSOs uh, rely on statistics um, and it, it turns out that it's it has been manipulated or misused, then it can erode public trust, not only in data, but also in the civil society organizations that have been using it. Uh, by partnering with civil society, national and international institutions can strengthen the legitimacy of statistics, making them more resistant to political manipulation or misuse. Civil society can act as a bridge, helping to communicate complex data in ways that are understandable and meaningful to the public, thus empowering citizens to discern between reliable information and disinformation. To truly build trust, we must foster a culture of accountability and collaboration. So I, I think I would like to ask for uh, some, you know, just some thoughts on the role of civil society. Thank you. Good question. OK, we're going to go back to the panel for some, you know, if, if you feel like you uh, want to respond, uh, please do. We've got um, three three questions uh, from, from UNEP, you know, the sort of, um, uh, building trust in uh, statistics offices and statistics is not always in your hands. Um, and what is the role in calling out the misuse of statistics and speaks very directly to some of the messaging that Kara has shared. Um, and then a question from our colleague from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs around identifying some really under addressed needs. And then finally from Norwegian Forum for Development on role of civil society. You don't have to answer every question, but I will start with Karen if, the, if there's a question, if there's, um, if you'd like to come in on any of those and then likewise, we'll go down the panel very quickly because we've just got a couple of minutes and then we'll do another round. Sure. Um, so addressing the first one, um, you know, um, is there a role uh, for uh, 
to guard against how statistics are used. Again, I would just go back to to um, you know what I referred to before. If it's material, you can you can you know make uh, a statement um, that that you know you the statistics were incorrect. I don't I I can't see certainly from Statistics Canada's perspective, that we would ever say, no, you've misused the statistics. I don't think that would be where we would go because, again, I believe you'd become the political story in that. Um, so, but if you are working with groups for literacy, you can combat that, um, right? So you're starting at the ground and it's going to take a while to build that up. But but if you work on literacy, I think you can, you can address that. Um, I'm going to skip to the third question. Um, on civil society. I think civil society has an important role to play, um, particularly in the SDGs, right? Sometimes uh, the data that civil society holds may not be, um, uh, it, it can't be used for national reporting. However, you can use some of the data. And, and just as an example, what we did at StatCan, we did infographics on each of the goals and we've done them twice. Um, and in them, we have a box. What is civil society doing to address the goals? And we try to use their data in that box. So we call it a community spotlight. Um, and it's to show that it actually takes the people on the floor, on the ground, who are, are working in, in communities to actually achieve the goals. So there is an important role um, with it. And maybe it's not in the national reporting at the national level for things, but that data are still important and it still can be used. Okay. Young do you want to come in on anything? Yeah, maybe I, I just want to add it to what it, uh, uh, Kara just said on the role of a civil society organization and, and uh, maybe also an advertisement for we actually have a side event on season data tomorrow, lunchtime. If you're interested, you're welcome to join the event. Uh, so uh, citizens uh, and the community play an important role in, in terms of the data collection through the whole like uh, data value chains uh, from the collection of data uh, and to validate data, even the promotion of the user data. So we, we really strong promote um, that uh, we the NSO and uh, working together with the CSO because it says the old data can be complementary to the official statistics. So maybe just a little bit on, uh, we will talk more on tomorrow. So you will hear the work on this area. Yes, thank you. Uh, first on uh, trust or misuse of uh, official statistics. The only example uh, I can come up with uh, the last couple of years from Statistics Norway is now and then journalists may misunderstand some of the numbers or some of the statistics and then we may actually contact them directly and explain that, look here, this is not exactly right. And then always they they uh, kind of adjust uh, and take that seriously. So uh, I don't uh, have any other examples, at least from our uh, side, where we have gone been more active out there. So, so it's a, it's a balance because we don't. The reason that we are a bit conservative, as I mentioned earlier, is that we want to protect the trusts. So, uh, so it's 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 kind of in a way the good uh, compared with the best. In a way, you have to be careful so you don't harm. Mm. Okay, that was the, the the first point. The second about uh, the capacity building. I think we have a very good relationship with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and and Norad. And, and uh, my impression is that we are very well aligned also about the priorities. And from Statistics Norway, I think our one of the headlines from our side uh, the last years has been that it's important for us to have some what to say staying power. That uh, when we build partnerships. Uh, in different countries that we can, it takes time to build relationships. Uh, uh, and uh, so it's important that we can know that when we have started in a country or with a, with a program that it will continue for some time. Uh, so because if it's, if you jump from one area to another, uh, then I, I think you risk to, uh, to undermine, uh, at least the investment won't pay off in the same way, I think for the country that you want to support. And the third thing about civil society, of course, we have uh, we are very interested in user dialogue. So for us, the civil society is the you know the the, the users that we we want to interact with, and uh, we get responses and con we are contacted uh, regularly, and and we are happy to to continue that dialogue. Yeah. 
I think that model is something also that we would like to increasingly see in uh, in the development cooperation and like capacity uh, development. So that capacity development is not only about you know technical uh, developing technical competencies, but also in the models of how to engage while still maintaining that integrity. Uh, so that's the, um, I think one area that we need. And that we should um, look at and how we can do that better. And that's sometimes done with other actors, right? Not only between a statistical office and another statistical office, but maybe with civil society or other parts of government uh, where there is that um, engagement. But I think the main problem when it comes to capacity development uh, is you know, we need to grow the donor uh, community. Um, uh, it's currently it's uh, it's there are not very m many donors that have a broad support uh, to capacity development in statistics, uh, and I think that's something that um, you know to to raise that uh, as an actual uh, constraint is uh, is it's important to be honest about um, about that. Uh, it doesn't happen um, by itself. It needs uh, investment and it needs kind of concerted efforts over time. Uh, it's um, it's you, we can't workshop our, our way out of it. Uh, it's a long it's a long process uh, of building also trust between uh, capacity providers and um, and on the recipient side. And I think the issues on on misinformation. Uh, this is not a this is not a challenge for statistical offices uh, alone. Right. This is a very very broad. Uh, issue that we need to encourage countries to take a very comprehensive uh, look at uh, and how to use the various actors uh, within government and civil society and uh, um, yeah and so I think that uh, literacy uh, around information and misinformation uh, is equally important uh, as you know the literacy on statistics uh, it plays a role, but it's a broader um, agenda and that I think, you know, statistical offices and uh, the statistical systems at country levels can play a part, uh, but can't solve on its own. And then over to Denise, you're, you're having the last word on the panel because we will wrap up after you, I'm afraid. Yeah, over to you. Uh, the key challenge for me is to seek new ways of communication. Yeah. It, like a translation the statistics for different audience and we can use infographics storytelling store maps social media videos and materials for students and teachers and to add information uh, in a good way uh, statistics canada for example uh, that has uh, many portals to to put information about confidentiality and the administrative records uh, and it's in a didactic way to, to different types of users known experts including yeah and the civil society is so important to to participate in the data ecosystems and in brazil for example now we are constructing the new sdg the sdg 18 about ethnic uh, racial equality and the civil society uh, has been uh, working with us in line ministries and the, the national statistical office and uh, producing the, the targets and uh, discussing the, the targets and the indicators for more, more adequate for these targets. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Denise. OK, we were definitely gone over time, um, so we are going to wrap up. I'm not going to summarize. This was um, a very uh, complex conversation with a lot of different threads. And I think we can, I mean, some of those um, issues um, will come up uh, over the next couple of days and colleagues can certainly uh, engage with the panelists during the coffee break. Um, so uh, that concludes the special side event. Thank you so much to to all of you. Really valuable insights, also very practical as well. Um, extremely helpful. And thank you to everyone for coming earlier this morning for joining us. Um, so the special side event is now closed. We're going to play a little video as we segue into the official opening.
of the IED. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. A moment of choice in the constitution. With just yeah. six years remaining, current progress is far longer than what is required to meet the SDGs. My God, the report reveals that only 17% of the SDG targets are on track, with nearly half showing minimal or moderate progress, and over one third still with poor regressing. <laughs> The convergence of multiple global crises has severely oh, hindered yeah. progress. Yeah. 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 The COVID-19 pandemic, escalating conflicts, yeah. geopolitical tensions, and growing climate chaos have severely hindered progress. Right. We must expand on successes to drive accelerated action. We're seeing significant progress in reducing child mortality, HIV prevention, and access to water, sanitation, and energy. We are at a critical moment of choice and consequence. We need bold action for peace. Resolving conflicts through dialogue and diplomacy. Financial support. Reforming the global financial system to support developing countries. Implementation surge. Investing in critical areas like food, energy, social protection, digital connectivity and more. We must empower women and girls in all our efforts. This year's Summit of the Future and upcoming conferences in 2025 are our chance to accelerate progress. <laughs> we must act now and act boldly to rescue the SDGs. The choices we make today will shape our collective future. United, we can overcome any challenge and realize the world we want. Just to make you a or just. Yes, yeah. yeah.
Uh, okay, colleagues, now let's move to the open uh, session of the 15th uh, IEG SDG meetings. Uh, so welcome uh, everyone. And so maybe just a, a quick introduction myself again for the uh, colleague who joined late. Uh, so my name is Yong Yi Min. I work at the UN Statistical uh, Division. So we support the IEG SDG uh, group and we're the secretary. And so before I, I introduce uh, the opening sessions, I would really like to thank the UNDP Global Policy Center for Governance and the Statistical Norway uh, to co-host uh, this uh, meeting. I know it's a lot of work, uh, so we really, really appreciate uh, you host us in this, in this beautiful city um, of Oslo. Um, so let's uh, start the opening session. Uh, first, I would like to uh, invite Arvin uh, Gatgil, uh, the director of uh, UNDP Global Policy Center for Governance, um, and to, to uh, have the opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. Um, and let me just start by saying, giving my apologies, because my name was on the screen earlier. I was supposed to join the uh, the opening side event, but I was unfortunately involved in a traffic accident this morning. But uh, all is fine. I made it just just in time for this. But uh, I want to, uh, you know, say welcome to you all, to, to Norway, uh, but also welcome to this meeting, which I at least attach a lot of expectation to. I mean, you know how important the issues that you're here to discuss are, but I don't think, unfortunately, the world fully appreciates your role. But those of us who do study what you do and follow what you do realize that you are, in fact, the standard setters of the biggest global ambition we've seen for humankind. You set the goal line for the Agenda 2030. And this particular comprehensive review in this meeting is perhaps the most important of those sessions. So I'd like at least for you to know that us as facilitators and helpers in making this uh, meeting happen, uh, understand the gravity of your task, the importance of your collaboration, and the challenge of the technical, uh, uh, the technical uphill challenges that you're up against, um, and that uh, we we really do place a lot of trust and confidence in your ability to solve those challenges. Now, to my formal statement. Today's gathering underscores our collective commitment to advancing the 2030 Agenda, ensuring that the promises made are tracked with integrity, accuracy and inclusivity. The SDG indicators form the foundation of this critical work, providing us with the evidence we need to steer our efforts, measure impact and address gaps. This meeting serves as an opportunity for us to strengthen international collaboration, sharpen our methodologies and address the complexities that arise in monitoring progress and SDGs. As we discuss the implications of recent global processes and events, emerging trends, innovative approaches like citizen-generated data, we also heard from Cara earlier this morning, and data gaps, let us keep in mind that the quality and reliability of SDG indicators will guide how effectively we can meet the needs of our people and our planet. With the 2030 deadline for the SDGs rapidly approaching and many targets off track, only 17% of targets have been achieved, as you know very well, we must collectively redouble our efforts. The Pact for the Future is an important promise by Member States to future-proof the SDGs, bringing together commitments in areas where progress has been slow or where new challenges have emerged. The most effective approach to catch up is to focus on synergies between goals to ensure that progress in one area catalyzes positive changes across others. Certain SDGs are indeed foundational and warrant greater emphasis for achieving broad transformative impacts. For example, it is widely recognized that SDG 16 and its targets promoting inclusive, accountable and effective governance are critical enablers or accelerators of progress across the 2030 Agenda. UNDP's Global Policy Center for Governance has a special focus on SDG 16, helping to ensure that countries have access to tools, technical and financial support to monitor progress on governance, peace and justice targets. Many countries are prioritizing reporting on SDG 16, and this is reflected in an increase of data availability from almost no information to 51% in 2024. It is also reflected in the significant increase in the number of countries that are prioritizing SDG 16 in their voluntary national review reports. This is also evident in the significant progress made in advancing international standards for governance statistics driven by the efforts of the prior group on governance statistics. Many of you are engaged in that, where this center continues to play a key supporting role. 
UNDP has for a long time championed a human lens to development thinking. This means defining what matters to people, including their human rights, well-being, and agency, and combining it with a forward-looking perspective that considers planetary pressures to create new opportunities for the all. The world must redesign how we measure progress in the future to go beyond GDP, and governance metrics are an important part of that. In closing, I would like to just underscore that the work of this group is not just about numbers, it is about people, communities, and the planet. The indicators we discussed today are the tools that enable us to turn ambition into action and goals into reality. They help us ensure that development is not only sustainable, but also equitable. UNDP through the, UNDP, through the Global Policy Center and other teams remains deeply committed to uh, supporting the work of this group and to strengthening our collective efforts to achieve the SDGs. Together, through rig rigorous data, thoughtful collaboration and shared expertise, we can transform the promise of the SDGs into tangible outcomes for people everywhere. So let me end by saying this. Use this time well together. Challenge each other and put forward your views in a candid way. We need to be clear and forward with each other because only then can we solve these complicated development puzzles that we are entrusted with. Good luck and thank you for your trust in us in facilitating this meeting with the other co-host. Thank you, Yogi. Thank you so much, Arvin, and really appreciate uh, um, your praise of the work of the IEG. And also, uh, we we really um, like uh, thanks the UNDP and for the many years' effort in building the governance statistic. So now I move uh, to our next speakers, and I would like to welcome uh, Gil Axelsen, the Director General from Norway, to give an opening remark. Thank you, and good morning, everyone, uh, once again. First of all, let me thank you, Arvin, uh, and your team at the UNDP Global Policy Center for Governance uh, here in Oslo for taking the initiative and offering to host this 15th meeting of the Interagency and Expert Group on SDG Indicators. We are very happy that you invited us to co-host, uh, and it's not every day that we can welcome such a broad collection of good colleagues and partners from countries and international organizations across the world. And I'm also especially glad to see that NGOs, interest groups and civil society, some of you core users, show such, such interest in questions around the choice of measurement uh, tools. And as I understand, this is a very important meeting in the, this group. During the days here in Oslo, the experts gathered will conclude on the last major revision on the indicator set. When the 2030 agenda with a rather overwhelming 17 goals and 169 targets were decided uh, in 2015, it challenged the global statistical community and maybe even more the national statistical offices and systems. We had to dig deep within our own statistics to try to answer the questions the agenda uh, asked from us. And we also had to take a wider approach. Uh, and many now uh, have the role as hubs for both national and international reporting on the SDGs. For Statistics Norway, this has meant more involvement with how the government works with the 2030 Agenda, and it has opened uh, for a closer dialogue with other statistical producers as well as users. An example is the strong uh, engagement of the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional uh, Authorities for enabling the regional and local authorities to work with SDGs based on facts and by using relevant indicators. This led to a fruitful cooperation where Statistics Norway developed a taxonomy for classifying indicators related to the Sustainable Development Goals, published in 2021. Looking back, I think we as a community have come out of this more aware of our role, maybe more prepared and hopefully stronger than before. I have a sense that we have become more visible in the UN system and beyond. But there is still a way to go. And at the country level, we must do this work at home with our own stakeholders. As we heard from the panel discussion earlier today, our role as producers of high quality facts is more crucial than ever. And we cannot afford on behalf of our societies not to fight this information. And one thing we can do is to stay relevant, actively engage with our users and make sure our statistics is usable. So with this, I can only say a warm welcome and I wish you a fruitful two days here at the Red Cross Center. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Angel, and thanks again for hosting uh, this meeting. So next, uh, I will move to Otario Peterson, uh, the Head of Governance from the Norway Agency for Development Cooperation, to give your opening remark. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to Oslo. Uh, we I will keep my remarks very, uh, very short. I mean, it, a lot has been uh, said already in this uh, in this uh, open re remarks, both from Arvin and and Gay. Um, I want to thank you also for inviting us as a, as the development corporation. We don't have a formal role uh, in this, but we're really interested in listening and engaging with this platform and this community. Uh, to be able to bring uh, the co the competencies and the outcomes of this meeting into other discussions, we think that we can play a role in in linking um, the discussions and statistics uh, for on, around the SDGs and um, into other core uh, core uh, multilateral processes, and in this way also uh, to to visualize uh, the need for improved investments here. So. Um, we uh, need to support the countries to um, to measure and to have dialogue uh, on the progress towards the SDGs. But I also encourage you to to keep in mind the balance between the need for for global measurements and the need for using the the data and statistics available at the national level. It is a challenge for many countries to to manage both so keeping both uh, um, at the back of our heads while we're discussed is is important uh, we particularly uh, look forward to seeing the outcomes and the governance uh, and inequality indicators which i think think are lagging behind uh, and is also um, uh, going to give us uh, more fuel uh, in the last few years towards the 2030 agenda. We know that these are drivers for many of the other uh, uh, sustainable development goals, and uh, and uh, therefore we have particularly eye on these as we're going forward. Um, I want to second also what has been said here about putting people at the center of these processes. Uh, some people from the outside might think, think that this is only about numbers and figures, but it is really about describing the realities and the way forward for uh, the sustainable development goals and the people at the center of that. So with those few works, words, I just want to wish you fruitful del deliberations and we really look forward to the outcomes of this meeting. Thank you very much, uh, Tara. And also, we, we really like the, to uh, thank you, um, uh, Nora, that to ha have been supporting the uh, capacity building. And uh, in particular, uh, we have a program on data for now. You also support our, our collaborate on citizen data. So we really appreciate and uh, Nora support in moving this uh, agenda forward. So next, I would like to invite Mike two co-dear co-chairs and the first uh, maybe Cara Williams uh, from Statistical Canada uh, to give the opening and remark. Thank you, Yongi, um, and thank you to Statistics Norway and UNDP for welcoming, welcoming us here to this beautiful city. Um, I have fallen in love with uh, Norway, so I'll be back. Um, uh, and welcome, everybody. It's so good to see um, old friends and meet new friends here again. Uh, we've been on this journey for some time. Some of us have been on this journey all along. Um, some people have, have come in um, and left and come back again because it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> So we come together this week to um, to share um, SDG implementation um, experiences with within our countries and our organizations, and to update on the work being done uh, around the globe uh, on the global indicator framework. But most importantly, we come together. This is the last chance to uh, revise the global indicator framework. So we're going to talk about the comprehensive review. Um, and this is this is the last time for the, a, a major change of the indicator framework. So this is a very important meeting um, today. Um, and I just want to say you know, we've got a lot to go through. Um, we're so happy to receive comments um, and the collaboration that we've received um, through the global consultation um, and all along this process. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Denise. Um, so welcome. 
Thank you, Kara. Uh, good morning, everyone, once again. It's a pleasure to be here and see you all in person. Thank you so much for your presence and everyone is very welcome. Uh, today, uh, we are going to talk about on the 2025 Comprehensive Review, the activities carried out uh, by the IND SDG working groups, share good practices and, and many other important topics for us. Uh, working with 23rd Agenda, uh, all of us contribute in some way to construct a better world. And I needed to say thank you for, for all for this uh, strong work to, to produce <laughs> the SDG indicators. I hope we have a fruitful meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all the uh, panel members to give a, a, like an excellent opening remark. So we will close this opening session and we will go move to the coffee break. So please come back at 10.30 sharp. Okay. Thank you.
Summit of the Future and the SDG Report 2024. Um, the, the first speech uh, is Elsa from High Level Group, co-chair. Uh, she will uh, speak about a high level group on partnership, coordination and capacity building for statistics for the 23rd agenda. <laughs> Please. Good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, present as a co-chair of the High Level Group for Partnership, Coordination and Capacity Building about our work for uh, preparing the um, uh, organization of the United Nations World Data Forum, which is going to be in uh, Colombia, in Medellin, in November of this year, from uh, 12 to 15 of November, which is hosted by the Statistical Office of uh, Colombia. I guess it's... Okay, I'm uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Can I move from here? I hope so. Correct? No? Ah, uh, here. This okay. Yeah. Take this one. For your information, the high level group. It's approved on uh, 40, uh, 46 of the United Nations Statistical Commission, and uh, its uh, job is to uh, to organize as well the United Nations World Data Forum for Sustainable Development for Agenda 2030. The first meeting is organized in the Cape Town when uh, it was precise the uh, global action plan in which were identified six strategic areas and uh, for achieving 14, 14 objectives uh, through 66 uh, key action. Uh, was continued for the fund uh, raising in the and identifying the funding mechanism in the Dubai Declaration, which uh, was organized on 2018. And uh, as you know, during the 2020, the COVID-19 uh, was uh, around the world, and on that uh, time, it was planned to organize another United Nations World Data Forum, the third one. And in fact, it was organized a virtual meeting in which was mentioned the, posit the position of the national statistical offices in the during the COVID-19 world pandemic. After that, in the 2029, uh, was organized in uh, Switzerland, in Bern, another, uh, the fourth United Nations World Data Forum, in which was uh, mentioned the position of the official statistics and national statistical uh, agencies in the wider data ecosystem system. And for the first time, we discussed about the data stewardship and ecosystem of the data under the logo Road to Burn. On the uh, 2023 was organized the fourth United Nations World Data Forum, which uh, was hosted by the China Statistical Office and was organized in Hangzhou. And uh, the motto it was uh, the recommitted to global uh, to Cape Town Global Action Plan with a focus on reducing set of the strategic areas. On the Cape Town Global Action Plan, as I mentioned, were identified six strategic areas. And in fact, during this uh, uh, forum was uh, raised the, the issue how to reduce those six areas to be more relevant and to be more effective on it. And uh, as a result, the, this uh, year, the forum is going to be organized in the Madeline. And one of the focus, it is the revision of the Cape Town Global Action Plan. To differentiate it from the previous uh, version, we call it Cape Town Global Action Plan version 2. And in fact, it is the second generation that we are spreading out the global action plan in which we need to announce it, we need to commit it to be engaged in all the action that are planned in this uh, 
plan and uh, the way how to communicate the global action plan. In fact, we were organized in the four joint working group in the with idea to prepare the forum outcomes. And in fact, we focus on the Pact on the Future, which were the motors for preparing the, the outcome that will be launched in the, in the Medlin, in the upcoming uh, forum, declaration on the future generation, and as well the global digital compact and the compact in the, around the world and as well in the National Statistical Office. We work on the mapping between the new priority layer and the action layer. What was uh, the, uh, the priorities uh, identified by the priority list, taking those that are more important and taking out those that are less important. And as, as well, to identify the action for achieving those priorities. And initially, uh, that are a difference, differentiate between the global action plan version one with the global global action plan versus two. As uh, uh, we have uh, the same terminology, we use the same language and we use the same structure, all the groups that were created. And we keep in mind to identify the areas to categorize the key statistical data, uh, statistics and data for the capacity building. As well, it was our task to identify the priorities for each of an area that were identified and keeping in mind to, to work on those that were really the most important to take into consideration and as well where uh, we need to identify the specific action for realizing those priorities and as well we need to, to undertake for uh, completing the projects and the the, the priorities that needed to uh, or required a, a considerable number of the actions to be achieved. As, as well, the fourth were the commitment we needed to identify the uh, obligations or responsibilities of the, of the group that uh, should take into consideration those actions for achieving the main goal. As you can see, we identified that uh, we merged from the uh, six uh, strategic area in which were uh, committed to the Hangzhou uh, United Nations World Data Forum. And we achieved in the four thematic area, which will go to be presented in the upcoming forum. And we identify the new areas and the new sources for further development. As you can see, we merge the uh, strategic area second and three, just in one. As today, it's a really very important, the innovation for better and more inclusive data, which is our motto today in the in the in the global uh, in the global uh, actions. And uh, the fourth uh, strategic area was moved by the priority we identify that it should be as a, should be considered as a second priority, maximizing the use and value of data for better decision making. And in fact, new was which was uh, discussed and included his, it was to identify the use and value of data and statistics for better, for better decision making. Uh, during our discussion in our joint group, we identified the new era that are really uh, very important to, uh, to be taken into consideration. As building trust, protection and ethics in data, and in fact, in the today's webinar, uh, our panelists identify the challenges and opportunities, how to, to increase uh, the trust and how to build in and how to be more confident in the, in the data and in the statistics. And in fact, here we identify the role of the institutional leadership in the building of trust and protection and ethics of data and uh, statistics. We continue and we uh, judge that we should merge together three strategic areas, first, fifth and sixth in just one, which is effective partnership. And even uh, to, in today's morning webinar, we discuss and the panelists mentioned the challenges about 
about uh, to have a good uh, par uh, partnership, effective partnership, communication and coordination between the partners for better data and more equitable data ecosystem. Those will be the four thematic uh, areas that will be presented in the upcoming um, United Nations World Data Forum. And in fact, as uh, you can see, the action that should be taken for the uh, new global uh, uh, global action plan are four, which are update and harmonize legal framework for the use of new data sources, which is a really very important in nowadays where the various data sources are in the area, as uh, not only the public, but as well the privately held data, and we should have the strong legal framework in place for better using those sources. And uh, 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 together with the establishment and maintaining the regional peer review mechanism, we need to review how good and in which qu uh, quality those are achieved. And the second is the harmonizing and mainstreaming open data frameworks across the wider data ecosystem. Those are the other actions that should be taken for achieving our the second priority. And of course, investment in the statistical literacy to educate the public, to educate the public how to read, how to interpret, and how to use the data and statistics, which is really very important nowadays just to, uh, to allow the misinterpretation and disinformation of the, of the data and statistics. And of course, uh, the fourth action is to further encourage the donors and and to discuss funding coordination and just to see the economic benefits on those countries uh, which are in the development process. And you can see as well the relation with uh, version one of the global action plan. In fact, it has been uh, a long time that uh, we have worked together and uh, in fact here the role of the program committee together with the issues partner has been really in focus on the preparing the, uh, the program and identifying all, uh, all those uh, areas where we should be uh, focused. In fact, during the February and March, it was a collaborative discussion uh, within the high level uh, group members in which together with the issue partners and the program uh, committee and we uh, on April June uh, the process was drafted and was discussed among all the members of the high level group and in fact during this year we have organized many meetings in the high level group just to discuss all those thematic uh, areas that will be uh, presented in the upcoming event. In October now uh, the global action plan uh, version 2 it's open for the public uh, consultation and we'll continue to launch it in November from 12 to 15 of November in Medlin. And uh, during the November to February, we are going to organize a survey for the to, uh, to identify uh, the, the use of the Global Action Plan, the reaction of the Statistical uh, Office, but not only beyond the Statistical Office, all the other stakeholders, and the communication strategy, how we should communicate the action that should be taken for achieving the action plan uh, in the global level. The aim why, uh, why the uh, Global Action Plan is open for the public uh, consultation, it's uh, obviously that we uh, we need to, to raise awareness of the public about the action plan that should be achieved in the new era of the development around the world in the various uh, sources of providing data and statistics and as well in the more uh, need for the more granular data and to be relevant in the information that should be uh, should be published as well to review the actions and maybe to see how we can interlink between the sources or between uh, uh, between the 
the stakeholders. Of course, we need to connect with the commitments. We need to be aware about the action that should be taken for the further development and uh, to consider how to measure the implementation of the actions foreseen to the uh, to the global action plan. Uh, finally, we decided to have four thematic areas which are focused on the first, innovation for better and more inclusive data. The second, maximizing the use and value of data for better decision making. Third, building trust, protection and ethics in data. And the fourth, effective partnership for better data and a more equitable data ecosystem. Uh, in fact, the, the program in the upcoming uh, events, it's a really so and very ambitious that on the 12th of November it is organized, it is planned to have the opening day plenary organized by the host country, by DANE, uh, Statistical Office of Colombia. And uh, during the period 13 to 15 November, four plenary sessions based on the thematic areas are in plan to organize by the identified and planned by the program committee. As you can see on the right side, uh, a list of the events that are in plan to be organized during this uh, big event. And on the 15th of the November, the closing plenary organized by the host country and the secretariat of the UNSD, it's in plan to, to close the, the big event. And of course, you can see that uh, 60 parallel sessions, 11 short talk sessions, and a considerable number of the events that are uh, planned and are organized by the hosted the country and as well in collaboration with the UNSD Secretariat. Here you can find some information uh, that uh, could help all those that have been planned to attend that uh, big event and think, in fact, I hope that all of you or in majority, the, you can uh, join this big event, which is a really the very important event for, uh, for strengthening the role of data and statistics in ecosystem in all our countries. And of course, you can find and you can be informed for the latest development through those links that you can keep the notes, you can uh, click on them, you can find the, uh, the various information about the organization of the, of the event and the, uh, you can identify the social media channels in which all uh, the way how the event is organized, the importance of the event, the thematic areas to be discussed, the action to be taken into consideration, the partners that have contributed in organizing the events, you can find all the information. And of course, you can share your voice through the online platforms, through the mentioned podcasts or the blogs, or through the arrangement of the local meetup events. Again, you can find here the steps, how to register to attend and plan your trip, how to follow and share the spread the words in the social media about this event and the more information that you can uh, find in the available web website, which is done by DANE, Statistical Office of Colombia, the hosted country, but as well and by the UNSD Secretariat. And of course, you can hashtag the UN Data Forum, Better Data, SDG, data innovation and data partnerships. The next host, in fact, it was uh, uh, difficult to identify between that uh, three countries that uh, prepared the bits and presented uh, the way how they they plan to organize and to host the next United Nations World Data Forum. And those three countries were Kenya, please, Qatar and please, Saudi Elsa. Arabia. Elsa, yeah. sorry I mean about the, the, the final, the final side. Finished. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, the next 2026 United Nations World Data Forum will be hosted by the Saudi Arabia Statistical Office and the forum will take place in the Riyadh, Saudi. Thank you very much for your attention. If, uh, if you have any question, I'm ready to answer you. Thank you. I guess I close. <laughs>
Thank you, Elsa, for your very good presentation. Uh, now I open the floor for Young Min from UNSD. Uh, she is going to uh, talk about the Sustainable Development Goals Report 2024. Thank you, Denise, and uh, I would like to maybe have a quick presentation Thanks. Uh, about uh, uh, the uh, some key finding from the uh, SDG report on 2024. Um, I think, um, let me see, yeah. Uh, we know that the world is facing intensifying and interconnected uh, uh, challenge and the crisis, uh, including uh, the, the scaring effects of the COVID-19 and the escalating uh, conflicts and geopolitical tension and the, the growing and climate chaos that the hitting the SDG uh, very hard. So the report uh, revealed that among the accessible targets, only 17% of the um, showing progress sufficient for achieve by 2030. Nearly half expect moderate to severe deviation from the desired trajectory, with 30% showing marginal progress and 18% showing moderate uh, progress. Alarmingly, 18% in indicate uh, uh, stagnation and 17% have regressed below the 2015 baseline level. So as the UN Secretary General mentioned at the launch of this report, uh, the world is getting a feeling great on the promise of the 2030 agenda. Looking at the goals under review at the high level political forums, uh, we see that under goal one, an uh, additional 23 million people were pushed into extreme poverty in 2022 compared to 2019. And apologize for the second one. I think we have update data from FAO. So over 153 million more people were suffering from hunger in 2023 compared to 2019. And uh, uh, about like 383 million more people suffer from uh, moderately or severely food insecure in 2023 compared to 2019. Undergoes uh, 13. Fossil fuel subsidy reached a historical high of 1.5 trillion in 2022. Under goal 16, the number of forcibly displaced persons rose to 120 million, 50% more than four years ago and almost doubled uh, than the baseline year 2015. Under goal 17, de developing country facing a four trillion annual financial gaps to achieve the SDGs. So if the current trend continue, by 2030, 590 million people may still live in extreme poverty and fewer than three in 10 countries are expected to halve uh, the na their national poverty rate. One in five children under the age five will be affected by stunning and 110% more fossil fuels will be produced uh, than would be consistent with uh, limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. Two million people will still living without safely managed drinking water, um, three million without safely managed sanitation, and 1.4 million without basic hygiene services. 660 million people will still lack electricity access and around 1.8 billion will go without clean cooking fuels and technologies. If we don't want this failing report card to be our future, we must accelerate uh, action to redefine the trajectory of the SDG progress.
So uh, we can turn things around uh, because SDG progress is already happening. There are successful examples of SDG progress that need to be accelerated and built upon, such as in Central and Southern Asia, they reduced the working poverty by 46% between 2015 and 2023. 134 countries has already met the reducing child mortality target, and seven more were on track in 2022. Gender parity in managerial roles in sub-Saharan Africa has improved 40% since 2000. And global unemployment hit a historical low of 5% in 2023. 100 billion annual climate finance uh, commitment uh, into developing country was met for the first time in 2022, and the marine uh, protected area coverage has increased more than um, tenfold from 2000 to 2024. So with accelerated action built on these successes, we can reverse our fa failing grade. So we are at a critical moment of choice and the consequence to ensure that uh, the future we want and the one that has been promised. So that the SDG are the best pathway out of our global challenges, and we must see this opportunity. To, this, uh, to turn this into accelerated and transformative progress, uh, as the Secretary uh, General mentioned, we need uh, three things, peace, solidarity, um, particular um, to unlock the much needed uh, financial and fiscal space for developing country and a search uh, in implementation in critical uh, areas uh, such as energy, education, health, uh, uh, digital transformation and more. Um, so I just want to maybe uh, with my last slides, I want to mention that uh, this, this report um, uh, it is the only uh, UN official report that monitors the global progress on the 2030 agenda. Um, the reason I mentioned this is because we, we've been receiving requests about the, the ranking of the SDGs. So we just want to clarify uh, that's not the official UN report. Um, and this, uh, we use the latest data and estimate um, provided by uh, 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 working together with the entire uh, system and working with all the custody agency and also the country collects the data from the um, uh, over 200 countries and the territories. With that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yongi, for your very good presentation. Yeah. Uh, now uh, I open the floor for Heather Page from UNSD. Uh, she is talking about the high-level political forum and summit of the future. Thank you so much. Um, I'll be sharing the key outcomes from the high-level political forum and also the summit of the future, particularly focusing on SDG monitoring um, and the role of statistics. So we have had the 2024 HLPF, the High Level Political Forum, which was held from the 8th through the 17th of July um, at the UN in New York. Um, and this also included a three-day ministerial segment. Um, and the forum focused on the follow-up to the political declaration of the SDG Summit, addressing the theme, reinforcing the 2030 agenda and eradicating poverty in times of multiple crises, the effective delivery of sustainable, resilient, and innovative solutions. Never a short title. Um, and the HLPF really, uh, they covered in-depth review of goals 1, 2, 13, 16, and 17. And here we have just kind of a a, a nice summary slide of um, who was there, um, how many keynote speakers and statements, uh, also the the um, the goals under review, as well as all of the different side events, VNR labs, um, exhibitions, um, and uh, uh, other focus for the the days. So the HLPF also comprehensively addressed challenges faced by countries in special situations, including SIDS and follow-up to the fourth international conference on small island developing states and the special needs of um, countries in Africa, LDCs, LLDCs, and MIX. Um, there were also 36 voluntary national reviews, um, as well as a ministerial declaration. Participants in particular expressed deep concerns that the SDGs are 
are off track and highlighted transformative and innovative solutions, um, strengthening the means of implementation, reform of the international financing institutions, and also partnerships among all the stakeholders for advancing the SDGs um, in the remaining years towards uh, 2030. And so following the HLPF was the Summit of the Future, which was really um, a pivotal moment for reaffirming global commitments. Um, the Pact for the Future, which includes the Global um, Digital Compact and the Declaration on Future Generations, underscores the importance of integrating science, uh, technology, data, and statistics um, into decision making. So this is supposed to be a forward-looking approach, really aiming to ensure that we are prepared for future challenges while also promoting um, sustainable development. So one of the central discussions was the critical role of data and statistics in monitoring the progress of the SDGs. Um, as we know, high quality disaggregated data is essential. This is why we are here and so excited. <laughs> um, but particularly for addressing inequalities, which was discussed earlier today, and also ensuring that no one is left behind. Um, and this is especially important um, in developing countries where data systems often need substantial capacity building and support to effectively track progress, but also um, around the world. So um, some of the key outcomes from the summit included a renewed commitment to closing the SDG financing gap. Um, and accelerating climate action. Uh, there's also a strong emphasis on moving beyond traditional GDP measures and developing new frameworks for assessing well-being and sustainable development. Um, leveraging digital technologies will be crucial in aiding the collection and analysis of data to monitor SDG progress uh, more effectively. And I have one last slide. And so another significant point is the importance of ethical data use in decision-making processes um, and strategic foresight and anticipatory planning are also highlighted in the pact um, as tools to guide decision-making and addressing future challenges. So finally, there was a call for increased investments in data infrastructure and statistical systems at both national and global levels, similar to what we heard this morning as well, um, which will be essential for building uh, robust monitoring frameworks. So thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Uh, let's uh, move on the next topic. Uh, point uh, three point working groups and task team of the ING SDGs. Uh, I open the floor for Mary Schmidt. Uh, she is W the GGI co-chair. Uh, she is talking about geospatial information and next steps following geospatial working groups rescuing paper. Thank you, Denise. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to give this presentation on behalf of the working group on geospatial information. That's the WGGI and um, the WGGI is one of the working groups and this session looks at other working groups of the interagency expert group. So Ireland, along with my colleague in Colombia, Sir Sandra Moreno of Dane, are the co-chairs of the working group on geospatial information. So, um, sorry, just um, the two topics I will be dealing with in this presentation is Firstly, the paper where we are presenting a paper on rescuing the SDGs. And this is being considered by the IAG for submission to the Statistical Commission next March. And the other topic I will be looking at is the short list of case studies. So firstly, to look at the paper on rescuing the SDGs with geospatial information how geospatial information can transform the production, measurement, monitoring, and dissemination of the indicators. We all understand that geospatial information and Earth observation can provide new and consistent data sources and methodologies to integrate multiple location-based variables to support the official statistics and the SDG indicators. These methods are there to fill data gaps and improve the temporal and spatial resolutions of data, 
by bringing together information from various sources. So Elsa had mentioned the importance of partnership. So that will be a, a key theme in this presentation. The WGGI has developed the paper to communicate and outline the opportunities and the role for geospatial information in rescuing the SDGs with a small and focused writing team composed of member states. The paper aims to highlight potential gaps in reporting and also potential quick wins to strengthen the geospatial perspective of the IAG process especially when discussing methodological and innovation across the framework as part of the 2025 Comprehensive Review. Further, to contextualize the work, work of the working group to include the SDGs Geospatial Roadmap, which was prepared two years ago, and other reports such as the Global and Complementary Geospatial Data and the Land Cover Data Sets for SDGs. So with the geospatial data, we are working towards leading to more targeted and impactful solutions. So what are we doing? We are use, use guidance on how SDG indicators can be disaggregated by geographic location by offering more localized and granular data. We're highlighting the need to consider improvements to the SDG indicator metadata the many geospatial capabilities to improve the metadata and in turn improving reporting. We are also using guidance on how geography impacts the indicators, highlighting approaches and guidance that could be developed to break down any of the challenges that we all face. How are we doing this? Well, we have implemented frameworks guided by the SDG Geospatial Roadmap, which is available on the website and as the mandated resource for statistical and geospatial actors working within the global indicator framework. We're increasing collaboration, and this is fundamental to ac accelerating progress, fostering collaboration with our teams and also agencies and peers as we all countries share the same challenges. Um, taking a geospatial approach, allowing a more innovative approach in using geospatial data across different targets and indicators, and to review and amend the SDG indicators metadata to incorporate a geospatial dimension. Beginning with the short list, which I will look at in a minute, the results analysis of the framework with a geographic lens. There's a geospatial basis for many of the indicators which can be produced, me measured and monitored. And I would like to emphasize we are focusing on a country owned, country led approach. So what this means is we have data available globally which can fill gaps if countries are struggling with producing indicators, but if the country has their own source and it's a better source, obviously it's up to the country to decide to use their own data. But we just want to emphasize that there is a lot of data out there globally and a lot of support there to fill the data gaps at national level. And we are looking at developing simple and impactful story um, story maps. So this is a way of visualizing the data. And um, over this week and at the last week in the UNEC SDG meeting, we have had a lot of countries coming forward and at this meeting as well. So if you have examples of geospatial work you are doing on indicators, please get in touch with us. And we will be delighted to showcase that so we can all benefit by supporting each other with the work we are doing. So um, just very quickly, um, what happens next? We have presented the work to the GGIM in New York for feedback at um, the ISGI, that's the integration of so social statistical and geospatial information expert group uh, in Nairobi. And this month we're presenting this this day we are presenting it to the IAG who, who will review the paper and hopefully adopt it for submission to the Statistical Commission 
in providing guidance and um, uh, for, review the focus on the SDG indicators. And next month we will be finalising the paper and um, presenting the final results to the IAG for submission to the Statistical Commission. So looking at the shortlist, on the left hand side is shortlist A and these are a list of indicators with the assistance of the Secretariat of the GGIM. We looked at the global database and have analysed the metrics of how SDGs in the shortlist are reported. So um, we've discussed this with the IAG Secretariat and this table, uh, table A is, a, um, we refer to them as low hanging fruit. That's the indicators with uh, data was already there geospatially from um, examples from countries. So these are geospatial information that can provide these indicators. And shortlist B is uh, the geospatial information can provide significant information to enhance these indicators by disaggregation. And again, I would like to emphasize when I sp speak of geospatial data, I'm not just referring to Earth observation and satellite data. What we want to focus on is the partnership with the mapping institutes in our countries and internationally, because just speaking from my own experience, we have worked with the Mapping Institute in developing our SDG platform and they are the data experts. So we didn't reinvent the wheel. We went to them and we worked with them in providing the statistics for the geospatial information that they had. And we have developed a very uh, fruitful partnership. And just when the COVID pandemic came, we were able to replicate the partnership with our mapping institute and literally overnight replicate the SDG data hub to produce the COVID-19 data hub for our official government platform for reporting data. And we were able to focus on the hotspots and localised data. So in terms of lockdown, we could see where the problem areas were. So we didn't have to um, shut down the whole country if a particular area was suffering. So in terms of promoting the work of the uh, our work plan for 2025, so we're promoting this work, <coughs> excuse me, at the uh, St Statistical Commission and um, the SDGs Geospatial Roadmap and the paper Rescuing the SDGs, the revised shortlist of the indicators and um, other events where geospatial information has a direct contribution. We're convening virtual seminars with members of custodian agencies and member states to promote case studies. And we're, we are convening meetings with countries implementing the SDG geospatial roadmap to check on progress, identify areas of improvement and fostering the sharing of our experiences. And then um, promoting the work at various forums. Number two, we are strengthening the coordination and coherence of geospatially enabled SDGs to promote coordination, coherence and um, work with other bodies bilaterally, support the custodian agencies with methodological assistance to bring geography to the global framework. And we're formalizing the cooperation with the UN expert groups on the integration of statistical and geospatial information and the support, support the task teams on the disaggregation of statistics by geographic location. We, all, we also liaise with the IAG and respond to em emergent requests from the IAG. We collect national experiences of how geospatial information is contributing to the SDG indicators. So as I said, please um, contact us and send us examples of your work. And um, we are looking at examples of how the SDG geospatial roadmap has been implemented and um, uh, methodolo methodological innovations as well in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of geospatial and statistical integration. So um, towards endorsing the geospatial and earth observation guidance notes. So the production of reliable indicators from Geospatial Earth Observation and Data Sources notes are presently available for four of the indicators, which you will see there on the bottom left-hand corner, 661, 
eleven three one fourteen one one and fifteen three one. So thank you very much. And just the key messages here, our geospatial information is official data for SDGs and the global indicators. There are established frameworks, standards, guides, good practices and methodologies that can be used at all levels for geographic disintegration from the national to the local. So the, these slides will be circulated and um, you can get in touch with either myself or my colleague, the co-chair Sandra Moreno in Colombia. And Sandra works with Dane, who Elsa had mentioned our co-hosting the event in um, two weeks time. And Mark Eiliff of the Global Geospatial Information Management. Thank you. Many thanks, Mary, for your time. Uh, now, uh, before moving on the next uh, speaker, uh, I, I ask if there are any questions for Elsa since she will have to leave questions or comments for Elsa. <laughs> no, I think it's... It was a so good presentation that the people don't have doubts about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let's move on uh, to the next presentation about SDMX header page on behalf of SDMX working group co-chair. Please header go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm presenting this on behalf of the SDG. No, what is this? The SDMX, <laughs> the, the SDMX working group. <laughs> Sorry, I need a little more coffee. Um, I probably won't be able to answer any of the questions related to this. I'm just, just the messenger. <laughs> Um, so this group, working group, was established in 2016. They've been with the IEGs since the beginning. Um, it's composed of 12 countries and 10 international agencies, currently chaired by Mexico. Um, UNSD Access Secretariat, um, one of our colleagues, is uh, Abdullah is very involved in the group, um, so he can definitely answer any of your questions. Um, so they also uh, host annual in-person meetings on the margins of some of the global events, including the SDG Oh my gosh, the SDMX Global Conference and SDMX Experts work, okay, Workshop. Um, so the accomplishments of the group in particular, um, I think important for, for our work, uh, they've developed and published the Global SDG Data Structure Definition in 2019 and the Metadata Structure Definition in 2021 um, and guidelines for their use. And I think a lot of the countries and uh, agencies are working uh, with this group. Um, they also maintain and regularly publish updates to the SDG, DSD, and MSD, um, and they assist with implementation of SDG data and metadata flows. So the SD, SDMX, data and metadata is available at APIs in a machine readable format. Um, it's a contribution to the implementation of the open SDG dissemination platform. And there's also extensive um, ongoing capacity building for member states that this group is engaging in. Um, they also have a data exchange established with countries and with custodian agencies, um, and also assistance in implementation of regional data flows. Uh, they've also developed e-learning course, um, an e-learning course on SDMX for the SDGs, and have made significant contributions to the development of SDMX 3.0 and 3.1. Um, so the data exchange and dissemination, the SDG global data set and metadata set is published at UNSD's application programming interface. And over 40% of the global data set is reported to UNSD as SDMX, which has been an increase um, over the years. The data exchange with the SDG SDG Lab has been established with about 40 countries, and this has proven to um, reduce the reporting burden for both the reporters and collectors. Um, this SDMX is actually actively used by regional commissions for their data exchange, um, and the open SDG platform, which uses, it, uses the global SDG DSD and MSD, is used by about 18 countries. So the group currently is revising their terms of reference for approval by the IEG SDGs. Um, 
And some of the proposed updates uh, include some new tasks for the period 2025 to 2030. Active participation in the working group meetings is emphasized also facilitating data interoperability. This is really the focus um, for countries and also with custodian agencies. Um, also focusing on common tools, including the open STG, uh, sharing knowledge and also um, uh, asking for additional members um, to engage with the group. Um, so these slides will be available on the website as well, um, where you can further look at the specific proposed new tasks for the group related to the development of validation and transformation language, georeferencing, and integration of statistical and geospatial information, um, exchange of information, as well as part uh, preparation of lessons learned and good practices established by the group. Um, and some of the highlights for their work plan is maintaining the SDG, DSD, and MSD, expanding that data and metadata exchange for SDG indicators, completing a pilot of validation and transformation language for SDG indicators, continuing capacity building with member states and custodian agencies, and also completing implementation of geospatial support, integrating preparations for the SDMX 3.1 and sharing of knowledge and experiences. Um, and so IEG SDG members and their experts are invited to participate in the meetings of the working group. Um, and they will also propose a special session for IEG SDG members wishing to learn more. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Heather, for your time. Uh, the next presentation will be about uh, task team on sustainable tourism and the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism. The speaker will, Kara Williams, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'll just wait for Clara to come up to the floor as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you an update on the task team on sustainable tourism um, and the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism. So I'll give some uh, update on the task team and, and then maybe Clara can talk to, uh, to us about the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism. I'm doing my own slides today. Oh. Okay, so as you may recall, um, the issue of sustainable tourism has been raised several times at the Statistical Commission. <clears throat> there was had been a proposal um, from UNWTO uh, for the 2020 Comprehensive Review that um, had been rejected by um, the IEAG. Um, and uh, as a result, it came up um, as a, an issue of uh, very great importance for many countries. Um, so in 2021, the commission encouraged the IEAG to continue to implement and refine indicators and requested that the group work with relevant custodian agencies um, to, um, to develop and test a methodology for indicators on sustainable tourism in preparation for the 2025 comprehensive review. It was brought up again and in 2022, it won't read these, um, again in 2023, and then in 2024, the commission expressed its appreciation for the progress made by the working groups, um, and including the task team on sustainable tourism. Okay. Um, so the task team was created in September of 2023. Members were 13 countries, five international and regional organization, and UNSD acted as secretariat. We had three meetings. Um, uh, in 2022 uh, was our initial meeting to talk about in terms of reference, presentations by UN Tourism, and there was a background paper and a review of a draft uh, work plan and timeline. We had a second and third meeting um, to discuss uh, potential indicators for target 8.9. We talked about the definition of sustainable tourism. Um, and in... Uh, well, currently, uh, UN Tourism developed a proposal for a new indicator um, to go under target 8.9, employed persons in the tourism 
uh, industry for the comprehensive review, which we're going to discuss this afternoon. So just a highlight of what that proposal was. Um, uh, employed persons in tourism industries, and it meets the methodology requirement. The metadata is in place. 40% uh, data is um, is there and a custodian agency. Oh, I'm not changing the slides. Sorry. Uh, a custodian agency is in place for um, this indicator. I will note that in 2020, a second indicator had been proposed, but unfortunately, um, it couldn't be proposed again this time because the data um, are just not sufficient enough at this point um, to be able to um, in, add it into the uh, indicator framework. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Clara now and, and she can walk us through a little bit more about the framework. Hi, now you can hear me. Apologies for that. So I will repeat my word of thanks, of course, to Kara and uh, Denise and to uh, the task team and all of you members of the interagency and expert group on SDG indicators for this, uh, for this great collaboration over the past few years and also for this opportunity to present um, the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism. Now, from UN Tourism, we have been fortunate to accompany this international development um, of, um, of consensus building over the past seven years. Okay, thank you. That's all right. <laughs> um, they wait. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. So, um, allow me to just then proceed. So, um, sustainable tourism is an area that has been high on uh, policy agendas, um, particularly in tourism, of course. Um, and the need for this framework very much originate, um, originated as a policy need. So tourism stakeholders have been concerned about the sustainability of tourism for decades now. Yeah, it's just it's just a lot more interesting with the slides. <laughs> That's why I prepared them. <laughs> Sorry, it's just Which one? This one. Okay, we may. <laughs> <Yeah>. Hooray. <laughs> 
Okay, so indeed. So as I was mentioning, there's been a lot of interest in sustainability and tourism circles for some time now, for decades, in fact, because few other sectors are as dependent on a healthy environment and functioning social structures uh, for their prosperity, right? Um, and of course, we had Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, there was also COVID-19, right? So we had, um, this was a dramatic period. Millions of, um, of people went out of work. Businesses were at risk. Um, severe losses were caused in revenue that supported environmental protection and, um, and livelihoods, even in very remote areas. And it meant a severe blow to economies and also to trade balances in countries all over the world. However, it also brought increased awareness about the role of tourism. Um, and the need to better monitor it and how it links to our economies, to our societies and to our environments. And in addition, um, in tourism and beyond, there is an increased recognition of uh, the role of tourism and how it can support or deter efforts towards sustainable development more broadly. Right. So we have uh, tourism explicitly mentioned under three of the um, SDGs. Um, particularly under target 8.9, of course, on the promotion of sustainable tourism, but also in target 12.B on um, implementation of tools to monitor sustainable tourism and under target 14.7 on increasing the economic benefits from sustainable use of marine sor sources, including tourism. Now, in recognition of these needs, in 2016, countries requested the UN Tourism Committee on Statistics to launch a program of work on measuring the sustainability of tourism. And this was done in partnership with leading countries and also UNSD and ILO, and with the support of entities like Eurostats, OECD, and many others. The development of a statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism was led by a multidisciplinary and multi um, stakeholder group, uh, expert group, set up under auspices of the UN Tourism um, Committee on Statistics and in close cooperation with the UNC, uh, the UN Committee on Environmental Economic Accounting, through which progress was annually reported to the UN Statistical Commission. Now, progress was also regularly reported to UN Tourism statutory bodies, its Executive Council and the General Assembly, and this was an important aspect of the development um, of this framework, this close cooperation between the statistical community on the one hand and the policy community on the other hand. Um, and of course, their maximum expressions were through the UN Statistical Commission and through uh, UN Tourism's General Assembly, which gathers the ministers in charge of tourism. Uh, there was an editorial board that supported the drafting of the framework and nine dedicated research teams fleshed out key measurement issues. Now, these were some of the main contributors in the process, NSIs and ministries, of course, from over 40 countries, as well as representatives from 30 international and regional organizations, but also subnational authorities, because that is also oftentimes where tourism legislation and management actually takes place, in addition to academia, civil society and private sector. Now, a total of 32 pilots um, fed the development of this framework, testing it on two fronts. On the one hand, for feasibility, um, it had to be feasible in a range of statistical realities the world over, from Canada to Fiji and Samoa, and also for relevance, whether the outputs, the data products, were in fact really meaningful to the user community. The development of the framework involved uh, involved a, a, a lengthy process, 
Um, and it's important to note that it was on the one hand, of course, very much a research and development process to make it methodologically robust and feasible in a majority of statistical uh, realities around the world, but at the same time also an engagement and consensus building effort to ensure the relevance to stakeholders, their capacity and their willingness to implement it, and also to support ultimately international comparability. The process was officially launched um, at the International Conference on Measuring the Sustainability of Tourism uh, that took place in Manila, the Philippines in 2017, where over 1,500 participants gathered, including chief statisticians and ministers. Sven, yes, you were with us, and uh, a number of other people in this room as well. And um, this was um, also complemented by a series of global consultations, expert group meetings, and editorial board sessions to help increasingly further define, uh, define and refine the framework. Now, I have to point out that collaboration with ILO was critical in this development process because it became clear very early on that employment is a fundamental aspect of tourism sustainability, both to maintain and sustain the operations of tourism over the long term, um, but also as a principal channel whereby tourism sustains livelihoods and the preservation of cultural and environmental assets. Now, the framework was presented to the UN Tourism General Assembly, the highest decision-making body globally for tourism matters, where tourism ministers unanimously adopted uh, the framework and called for its implementation in countries. And then it was subsequently also taken to the UN Statistical Commission earlier this year at its 55th session, resulting in the framework's endorsement. Now, the, uh, the commission had a quite um, enthusiastic discussion, if I may, about the, um, the, um, the framework. Uh, 34 countries actively took part in the deliberations, and we had three regional statements, including from the group of African countries, voiced by Benin, from the European Statistical System, uh, voiced by Finland, and also from the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, voiced by Saudi Arabia. In addition, the framework has also been recognized um, as the first sectoral example of moving beyond GDP. Now, with the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism, the scope of tourism statistics is extended to consider not only the economic side, but also more social and environmental aspects of tourism to measure it in a more harmonized and integrated fashion. It thus complements and builds on existing statistical standards uh, for tourism measurements, um, including the international recommendations for tourism statistics, which focuses on visitor flows, their associated expenditure, and the industries catering to their demand, as well as the tourism satellite account, which all of you uh, know, which nests tourism within the system of, um, of national accounts to um, value its economic contribution. Now, the endorsement of the MST framework presents a very timely opportunity to improve the monitoring and management of tourism as an integral part of our um, economic, social, and environmental systems that it is inherently nested in. Um, also, it presents an opportunity to improve the understanding of the role of tourism in the SDGs both within the global monitoring framework and also within regional and national monitoring efforts. The framework functions as a kind of menu to select and implement in a modular fashion those elements that are deemed more, most relevant in line with uh, country priorities and circumstances. And some of these areas are shown and they include on the environmental side, of course, elements like water and energy use, uh, the production of waste uh, and different emissions. On the social side, we come to the element of uh, persons employed and their characteristics uh, and further elements of decent work, education, but also elements like the perceptions of host communities and visitor satisfaction. And on the economic side, it looks at um, the economic um, aggregates from a sustainability lens, including things like characteristics of establishments in tourism and also seasonality. Now, the process does not end here. In fact, the most exciting part uh, is ahead of us 
as the MST process continues with the development of an implementation strategy that will include the collection of good practices and implementation guide and capacity development also upon the request of the UN Statistical Commission and also the development of an agreed set of MST-based indicators for international comparability purposes that will in turn also uh, support the expansion of the data sets that we manage at tourism, uh, at UN tourism on, on tourism. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Kara Williams and Clara van der Poel for your very good presentation. Now I open the floor for the participants uh, to make some questions or comments for the speakers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. It's working. Uh, thank you for your very good presentations. All very interesting. Um, Mary, in particular, your work, work you and the team have done uh, for your paper is very interesting. And UK appreciates the work you have done and the important topic and support the themes. I do note with particular interest the use of existing data that has been proposed to enhance. Uh, or supplement existing returns whilst kind of removing those silos between the national uh, and other global institutions like the group, uh, group on Earth observations mentioned by yourself. It's also welcome to see the reference to the existing frameworks that already exist, particularly as I know that the global statistical geospatial framework is currently being updated to be a bit more user friendly, which will help SDG reporting across the globe. I do think it's also important to emphasize that that use of pre existing data that has been proposed despite a potential initial outlay from statistical offices, when you use when you supplement them with the frameworks will increase SDG reporting. So thank you. Um, more broadly for other NSOs, particularly those with more resources, if that trail is blazed by those who have that initial capacity, that path has been laid for other NSOs to, to, to follow along after that. And then because words are easy, just on the theme of collaboration, domestically, the ONS, the Office for National Statistics, has already started to engage with this topic and have signed an MOU with our own geospatial information agency. And we've already used this MOU to explore reporting using data from our own mapping agency, particularly looking at SDG 11.31. 11 so we can chat about that a bit later about a potential case study. And this does showcase how this work can be achieved. And really, that is just showcasing how we can remove those silos domestically. Just from an international perspective, um, I know there are a lot of international efforts along geospatial and aligning with the existing outputs of NSOs. A recent example would be the CES and GGIM plenary that took place in, in June. And I also do know that your paper has been endorsed by the expert group on the integration of statistical and geospatial information. So it's now co-chaired by the UK. And just to emphasize, we do endorse the paper with its recommendations. And I do know that that, that group has offered to kind of support the paper into the future, particularly around producing outputs to help NSOs support. So thank you very much. Thank you for your your question. Any more questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael Diaz Medina from the ILO Chief Association. Uh, one comment on the SDMX uh, um, presentation. I know that maybe it's um, it's not the, we are we don't have the, um, the stuff from the from the group, but an important event that I think an event uh, development. I wonder how we can also uh, benefit from that. Is the, uh, the how to to incorporate the AI. Uh, tools in SDMX. I understand that the latest uh, meetings on the SDMX uh, uh, group has discussed widely about that, and it's very interesting. I think it's a, it's a very, uh, I would say, promising uh, effect that how 
how will be how SDMX will be enriched by these new versions on AI, which is as a search engine, and of course to 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 profit to to benefit from the SD, uh, from the SDG indicators, how we can enhance our capacity to share uh, between countries, between uh, custodian agencies and the countries also in, in globally, and and this could be a good uh, also. Uh, it, it has not been mentioned, but I think it would be good to know how to to benefit from that. And my second question or comment is on the on the sustainable and the sustainable uh, the framework, the new framework of measuring sustainable of tourism. As Clara was uh, was mentioning, the ILO has been has been deeply involved in that, and I would like to to mention the the to praise particularly the incorporation of uh, key aspects on quality of employment in the framework that will be, um, I would say, enriching also the way that tourism industries had been, uh, had been, um, I would say, focused in the last, uh, I would say, decades, and how the to welcome the, the, the notion that sustainability means that we have to have quality employment that all the decent work aspects of of these had been fully incorporated in the in this measurement which is important for the industries that we are talking about because they are conditions of work uh, osh there is occupational safety and health and and rights that have been incorporated also as indicators and we are also taking advantage of other SDG indicators that are in the framework, particularly in global in goal eight, but also in 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 other goals where we have these quality measures. And I think it's really welcome. And I think this was something that we have to work intensively with UN tourism to make it happen. And and congratulations for this uh, a framework that I know that has been endorsed by the UN Senegal Commission widely. And I I also want to offer our support to this uh, to the implementation phase that we are now facing in in developing accurate measures afterwards beyond the SDG uh, indicator that we are going to discuss this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Mary, thank you so much for your intervention. My name is Addie Irwin. I work with the Interparliamentary Union in Geneva. Um, I have to admit, I don't know a lot about geospatial data, um, but it did pique my interest because on your shortlist was SDG 5.5.1a, which is the percentage of women, uh, number and percentage of women in national parliaments. Um, our data coverage is quite high. It's at 98%, uh, up to 100% given uh, the, the month. Um, so I'd like to understand in what way uh, geospatial data could contribute to gaps. I'm assuming with historical time series, um, especially because I, I do have this conception of, ge of satellites and, and Earth data when I think about geospatial data. So I'd appreciate uh, discussing that more. Thank you for more one. Thank you very much and congratulations for the very interesting presentations. I just have um, Esperanza Magpantay from ITU, sorry about that. I just have uh, two comments, one on the working group on geospatial information. I really appreciate the work that has been done by the group and also would like to explore the possibility of collaboration. I, I saw that two of our indicators are included in the list, uh, 9C1 and 17C1, and I think it will be a good opportunity uh, for us to collaborate since we have been also exploring how we can use geospatial information for these two indicators. Um, another comment is on uh, the presentation from Clara. Congratulations again on, on the framework that you had presented, and I see that one of the uh, main objectives is to develop a global database, and I think this will be a big challenge for countries and NSOs uh, to, to have data for, for this particular indicator. And I just want to um, raise the, the work that has been doing, we've been doing at the international level on the use of mobile phone big data for different areas of statistics. 
including tourism. And this is one of the areas where the application of mobile phone big data has been crucial and, and proven to be effective in, in some countries. And so I would like to also raise that um, it will be important for the community to also explore that and, and consider that in, in, the, in the future work of, of the, the group. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Omar Sirajuddin from the World Bank, and uh, I guess the fifth question uh, and the uh, fourth question on geospatial data. So I don't know if you're overdosing on it, um, <laughs> but uh, my, uh, I re really want to commend you on the great work, Mary. And uh, my question is that is there a, a global database of where countries stand in terms of geospatial data gaps and so on? Um, the ODW um, has something uh, which we use, but are there other databases or is there any plans to collect such information? One more question, please, uh, from here. Sven, Sven, please. First of all, I, I like to, to congratulate uh, on tourism. I still remember when the, the process on, on MST started. I think at that moment it was still called uh, measuring sustainable tourism, and then we, we changed to, to measuring sustainability of tourism in, 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 the, in the course of the time. And I find it remarkable that, that we have there a linkage between two different statistical systems. I mean, we, we have the, the CS Central Framework for measuring the, the environmental economic impacts, and uh, it more or, or less uh, succeeded to, to link these two systems that we have something that is very much uh, comparable in, in, in one of the parts of the MST, so that we make use of the same methods, the same uh, definitions and so on, in two uh, different statistical systems. And uh, I think that's, that's very important uh, on the on the one hand, to, uh, when you look at the, the data production, but as well on uh, on the communication of the data, so using the same terms, using the same definitions, and probably the same production lines to produce data for for different purposes, uh, and that brings me to to a second uh, idea, and that's the the use of geospatial data. Currently, we're still discussing using geospatial data to produce SDG indicators. But when we are looking at uh, statistical production, uh, currently we have the, the the revision of the system of national accounts. We're discussing the the uh, revision of the system of environmental economic accounts. We we since two or three years have the the system of uh, of ecosystem accounting as a new uh, statistical standard in the UN. We probably need to think more about using geospatial data as input in these more complex statistical systems to then produce the indicators out of these systems to on the one hand have more comparable data over the entire spectrum of, of what we publish and uh, as a matter of resources because we we spend quite a lot of resources to, to produce indicators from the scratch, from, from the basic data to the indicator. Probably should make more use of existing statistical systems to, to save resources in, in the indicator production and have more comparable indicators over the entire set of SDGs. Thanks. Thank you so much for your contributions and comments. Uh, let's move on for the next topic topic of the agenda uh, on the data availability review and tier classification updates. <laughs> oh, sorry, because I'm seeing, I'm seeing the clock. Oh, no, <laughs> sorry. Can we go ahead? I think maybe can we... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So um yeah, perhaps just to uh to jump in on some of the comments raised. 
uh, starting with ILO. Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, moving into the direction of recognizing already employment as a fundamental aspect of sustainability and tourism opens the door now to also a wider sophistication of the data that can be produced. And also it very much goes hand in hand, no? the awareness raising efforts and, uh, and the statistical uh, development efforts. So very much looking forward to continuing our great collaboration uh, ITU, um, indeed, so tourism statistics is often taken to be also a bit of a front runner when it comes to the use of different data sources, alternative data sources, big data, mobile phone um, data. And um, when I mentioned the database, so the new framework will, um, will offer the basis for deriving indicators to expand a database that already exists that we compile at UN Tourism, uh, where we have over 150 aggregates and indicators that we currently already compile from countries, including uh, the proposed indicator on uh, unemployed persons, but many other types of also what we call basic data um, in tourism statistics. And a lot of this, a lot of it, or some of it in some countries, in fact, comes from the data source uh, from, uh, from, from mobile phones, um, among the many other sources that exist now for tourism statistics. Um, and uh, regarding uh, Germany, Sven, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So that was, uh, yeah, that was a big, that was a big uh, moment. In fact, also when we presented the technical note to the UN Statistical Commission on linking the tourism satellite account and the system of environmental economic accounting, and then um, so. In, in the beginning, we thought we we're just going to stop there, but then you know because we also had the policy uh, makers uh, on board, um, it it became clear that we needed to move beyond that, right? Sustainability is a lot more than just uh, water, energy, emissions, right? So um, so the framework got expanded uh, from there, but you're absolutely right. It's a beautiful example of how we can make use already of existing statistical infrastructures, existing statistical standards. Um, just thanks to everybody for the comments and um, to the UK. I know you're doing great work, so thank you for sharing with us your experience and um, the work the UK are doing as co-chairing the integration of statistical and geospatial information is a huge support to our work. And um, I know you've some great examples presented in the great work you're doing and just to um, the uh, speaker, sorry, I, I didn't write down in time your organizations, but um, if you contact me, I'll give you my details and we can um, share some of the work that's being done and particularly in uh, relation to women in politics, because at local level, we can display that information quite easily with geospatial information. And just to the World Bank also, if you could uh, please give me your details and I'll share with you the work that's being done. And also Germany made an important point there that increasingly a lot of our statistical work is turning towards the environment. And previously, maybe 10 years ago, if you suggested environmental statistics in our office, people probably would have laughed at you and said, oh, they can't fit into a nice, neat statistical table. But as we know, the world is changing and environmental and ecosystems accounts are a significant part of the work we do in statistical offices. And geospatial information is essential to this work because the uh, geos environmental and ecosystems don't fit neatly into statistical tables. And it's impossible to produce these without geospatial information as the required information doesn't follow neatly our artificial boundaries and um, geospatial information is absolutely essential as the statistics offices moves more and more into these type of statistics. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Clara and uh, Mary for your answering. Uh, now, I open the floor to 
<laughs> header page. Hello. <laughs> Very quickly. So we have, um, we're going to start digging in on get and start with data availability review. So just as a reminder, um, this is an exercise that the IEG uh, has every year where they review the tier classification for the indicators based off of the quarter three uh, data release. So tier one indicator is conceptually clear, has an internationally established methodology and standards are available and data are regularly produced by countries for at least 50% of countries and of the population in every region where the indicator is relevant. Um, and tier two indicator is exceptional conceptually clear, has an internationally established methodology and standards are available, but data are not regularly produced by countries. So the tier two indicators that meet criteria and are approved for tier one upgrade include three unique indicators, and they are 632, the proportion of bodies of water with good ambient water quality, um, 1011 growth rates of household expenditure or income per capita among the bottom 40% of the population and the total population, and then 17181 statistical capacity indicators. Um, and so the reason for flagging is usually um, an increase in coverage uh, to meet all of the thresholds, um, um, and in particular the countries, uh, the country. Uh, Proportion. So these were all recommended for upgrade to tier one and approved by the IAG uh, group. Um, there's an additional uh, tier two indicator that has met criteria but is a pending approval, um, which is 1751, number of countries that adopt and implement investment promotion regimes for developing countries, including the least developed countries. Uh, this is good, uh, has good coverage at the indicator level, however, some um, are estimated data. So the IG is uh, reaching out uh, to the custodian for further clarification from the agency on the proportion of country and estimated data. So these are the, the four indicators um, that would uh, potentially, or three that are upgraded, one that is pending approval. Um, so in this exercise, we also identify uh, indicators that are missing data. So currently um, of the 231 unique indicators in the global uh, SDG framework, we have 229 which have data. Again, this is based off the latest update, the quarter three, um, which was 28 September. Um, and so we have two unique indicators that are missing data. This is down from five indicators uh, from last year. Um, and so those indicators are 522, proportion of women and girls aged 15 years and older subjected to sexual violence by persons other than an intimate partner in the previous 12 months by age and place of occurrence. Sorry, I'm just trying to go a little fast. Um, and then there, 1132, proportion of cities with a direct participation structure of civil society and urban planning and management that operate regularly and democratically. So here we have the information from the custodian. We reach out to the custodians um, or as secretariat um, once these exercises have concluded to find out what are the status, um, what are the plans for data provision. Um, and so we've included here uh, the responses from agencies uh, for the last two years. Um, so just as a note, um, the IEG SDG is um, going to is requesting clarification from agencies of the actual timeline for data provision. Um, otherwise, they are to be considered for deletion based on the 2025 comprehensive review criteria. So this is just um, all of these slides will, of course, be available on the meeting website as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do you have any questions? For Heather. No questions. The two two indicators and have no data from the agency here in the response. Okay, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, maybe the custodian agencies that is uh, responsible for the two indicators of with no data uh, can can talk about. Look at this. Look. 
from UN Habitat. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, perfect. So Robert Ndugwa from UN Habitat. I think for 11.32, we've uh, been running a very rigorous campaign for data collection among the cities and then working very closely also with the countries. We are very much at the tail end of that process and it's uh, giving us very good returns. So we do hope that by December this year, we'll have a full update on the database. Thank you. Thank you. Any more comments? Ghana? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, as for the two indicators, I think five to two. Um, many countries uh, in the developing world, especially Africa, rely greatly on the DHS, the, I mean the Demographic and Health Survey, uh, multiple indicator cluster survey, among others, to produce data in these indicators. Thankfully, we have recently piloted the use of citizens' data for this indicator. And in, in Ghana's um, VNR 2025, you will see us uh, producing data for this particular indicator. So this probably tomorrow I'll be making a short presentation on that. And this may be an opportunity for countries to leverage citizens data to look at how to monitor this indicator. Thank you. Thank you for your suggestion. Uh, do you have any more questions or comments? No. Yeah, now we have the break for having lunch and the afternoon session will start 1.30. Uh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, really quickly. Um, just to provide you with some options for lunch and snack options provided by our lovely colleagues from UNDP. Thank you so much for these suggestions. Um, one, the Bon Me is the one that Maybe not that one. <laughs> not exactly clear on the reasoning, but just try the others, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy your lunch. We'll see you um, at 1.30. Thank you.
very busy issue. Yeah. So then she'll have it's one of like, yeah, one and a half more days. Oh my god, I okay. thought today was the day I really needed to get through, but it turns out it was yesterday. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's a bummer. Ah, I forgot to end the meeting. <laughs>